Silent Witch Fall 5, Tea Party Arc. V5C1, for the future, which will come one day as Earth GT Silent Witch May 23rd. 2021 8 minutes Serendia Academy has several unique curriculums for nobles that were not found in general schools. One such class was the tea ceremony course, which was only attended by girls. For ladies belonging to the nobility, a tea party was not just a time for pleasant conversation. It's also a social occasion where one's dignity was tested by how well one entertains or is entertained by guests. In the tea ceremony course, the students were thoroughly drilled on the etiquette there before performing the practical lessons. The practical lessons were held in the courtyard in the form of a tea party. Four or five girls of the same grade would form a group and sit at one table. Each student would bring a cup of tea to share with the other students, who would then evaluate the tea. However, since the teacher would set specific sweets in advance, Students were demanded to serve the tea to match it. In other words, the course was starting from when they began to prepare it. In the tea ceremony course, they had been assigned to prepare their own tea leaves, but they usually have their servants buy it for them in most cases. However, Monica had no idea where to even buy one, so after much worrying, she decided to turn to the self-proclaimed villainess, Miss Isabel Norton. Once Monica went to Isabel's room, Isabel happily offered Monica a seat and prepared tea and sweets for her. When Monica explained the situation while munching on a cookie with plenty of sugar sprinkled around it, Isabel nodded her head and patted her chest confidently. Her gesture was quite vigorous which unbefitting that of a young lady. If that's the case, please leave it to me, big sister Monica. I'll do my best to help you get through the class safely. T thank you very much. As Monica bowing her head, Isabel's maidservant, Agatha, interrupted her as she poured tea into her cup. If that's the case, please allow me to teach you how to make tea. Actually, it would be better if I could go to your place and teach you directly, but, that would contradict the setting where Lady Monica is being tormented by the Kerbeck family. Students were allowed to brew their own tea or have a servant brew it for them in the course. However, it's common practice to have a servant prepare the tea for them in most cases. Those who make their own tea were looked down upon as third-rate nobles who can't bring their own servants. But in Monica's case, she was supposed to be tormented by the daughter of Count Kerbeck, so it would be unnatural if Isabel's maidservant went directly to help her. P. Please give me some guidance. Monica bowed deeply to Agatha, which then she said, It's okay, just lift your head, to stop her bow with a laugh. Isabel, as well as Agatha, was a very thoughtful young lady and maidservant. Though they were a bit hard to get close to when they were acting like the villainess. In that case, what kind of tea would you like to serve, big sister Monica? Do they set any specific type of confections? Why yes. I it's butter cake, Isabel nodded her head and put her fingers on her chin, thinking about something. Choosing the right tea to match with the confections was also part of the lessons. However, Monica was not used to eating tea or confections. She was more used to drinking coffee because of her father's influence. Um, do you have any suggestion about tea that would match the butter cake, if it's just a simple cake with butter? Most basic teas will work well. It may be better to enjoy the cake with a slightly astringent or savory flavor rather than a light one. Milk tea is also not a bad idea, but, let me tell you, big sister Monica, Isabel trailed off and looked at Monica with a serious face then said firmly. The combination of tea and confections is a matter of personal preference, and there is no definite right answer. However, some combinations will definitely end up with the wrong answer. What does it mean that there is no right answer but some will end up with the wrong answer? As Monica was confused, Isabel spoke up. That was to serve the same thing on the same table. Ah, the practice lesson was held in groups of several people, and each person brought their own tea. It's certainly not a good idea to have the same kind of tea served at the same table. It is especially bad if you serve the same thing as someone who is in a higher position than you. 
Strictly speaking, the dress, hairstyle, and accessories that you wear to the tea party should be trendy but different, so you should put some thought into it. But since you will wear a uniform in the lesson, let's just think about the tea leaves for now. I had to think even that thought Monica in a shudder. As a Seven Sages, the only gathering Monica attended was the Conference of the Seven Sages, which was held only for the Seven Sages, and the dress code was basically robed, so she only had to wear the robes provided by the kingdom. Granted, Monica had never worried about her attire at social gatherings. This tea party for aristocratic ladies was likely more nerve-wracking than Monica had imagined. The best way to do it was to investigate the people in your group before thinking about the tea you will serve at the lessons. So, how many people are in your group, Big Sister Monica, um? Including me, there are four people, one of them is from my class. She is Miss Lana Khalid. as for the other two, they are from the other class, so I don't know them very well, during joint practice with other classes. They will be assigned to form groups with those who are close to them. However, Monica's unsociable traits made it impossible for her to talk to anyone other than Lana. As for Lana herself treated as a bit of an outsider in the class, she has no other girls she was close to. As a result, they were put in the same group as the remaining students by the teacher. One of them was Casey, a brown-haired young lady with a vivacious air while the other was Claudia, a calm, dark-haired beauty. After a brief greeting on the first day, the meeting was dismissed and they hardly had a chance to talk. Then, deciding the tea in advance would prove more difficult, as sorry, Lana would probably be able to provide her the details, but Monica didn't have any courage to directly ask the two girls, whom she barely knew. Furthermore, she didn't know their family ranks of the two girls. So if Monica were to speak to them, she might be perceived as being unpolite. Among the nobility, a person of a lower rank to casually talk to a person of a higher rank was taboo. In that case, I will provide you with several kinds of tea. At a tea party, those with the highest status are served first, so it's likely you would be served in last. That way, you can easily make sure that your choice of tea won't clash with anyone. T thank you very much, Monica bowed her head, slumping her shoulders then let out a deep sigh. This tea party thing is so hard, isn't it? When Monica looked unsure of herself, Isabel also let out a sigh with a troubled face. I wish my knowledge would be useful to you. I apologize for my inexperience, but if you wanted to learn how to act like a villainess, I could teach you all you need to know, I am fine. Even if it is passed down to her, she will never have the chance to use it. Absolutely not. Monica gave a wry smile, and Agatha, Isabel's maidservant, advised her with a very serious face. My lady, there may be an occasion in the future when Miss Monica will have to face a villainess other than you. For that occasion, how about teaching her about the behavior of a villainess now, eh? As Monica was twitching with a stiff expression. Isabel's put her hands on her face, saying wonderful, yes, that's a good idea. Big sister Monica is my heroine. I'm sure there will come a time when some other villainess will invite her to tea parties and tormented her, she sincerely wished to spare herself from such a future. As much as she desired it, she knew she could not say it in her current situation. After all, Having been elected to the student council as soon as she transferred to the school, and having her dance rehearsals watched by the same student council members, Monica has made enemies with the majority of the female students. The only people in her grade who would treat her normally were Lana, Glenn, and Neil. Now, the eyes of the people around Monica can be generally divided into two types. Those who despise Monica and show hostility towards her and those who look at her from afar as some kind of uncanny person. No one has called her out to the back of the school building or hidden her personal belongings yet, but many times she has been sarcastically remarked on as she passes by or giggled at from afar. Now, I will explain to you the behavioral patterns of villainesses, in case you come face to face with a true villainess someday.
They say that the first step to fight your enemy is to understand your enemy. Knowing what would a villainous do here, might come in handy one day. If possible, I really don't want that day to come. As Monica straightened her back to listen intently to Isabel's speech, in an instant. Ah ha ha ho, Isabel put her hand over her mouth, puffed her chest out, and smiled loftily. Hearing her voice, Monica's shoulders jerked, and Isabel pulled back her high-pitched laugh and straightened her posture. First of all, this is the basic move of a villainess. A high-pitched laugh. By laughing like this, you can intimidate and check your opponent, and at the same time, you can regain control of the situation. See can a high-pitched laugh have such an effect? To Monica's great surprise, Isabel nodded plausibly. However, if you use it too often, the effect will fade, so use it only with the right timing. Right, the timing of using special moves is important, apparently. As Monica was nodding her head, Isabel unfolded her fan in front of her. And basic move number two. Snicker silently, in a fluid motion, Isabel held the fan to her mouth to show the other person that she was laughing at them as if she were making fun of them. No matter how you look at it, her haughty laughter, which showed how much she looked down on the other person, will put shame on an actress's performance on a stage. Normally, covering your mouth with a fan when laughing is proper etiquette, but in this case, I deliberately lowered the fan a little to show my mouth to the other person. By doing so, I could blatantly show that I am mocking the other person. How detailed, Monica thought in shock. She never thought such minor details would have such effects. Of course, you can also hide your mouth with a fan and giggle to create a sarcastic effect. You should use different methods according to the character of the young lady. I, I see, T this is so profound. Yes, the more I try to master it, the more I realize how deep it goes, just to make sure, they're talking about villainous. Thus, the villainous course which was far more intensive than the deep brewing course, continued until late at night. It should be added here that Miss Isabel Norton was the top student in the tea party course of the first year of high school. V5C2, a lively young lady Azareth GT silent which May 24, 2021 4 minutes the joint tea ceremonies practical lesson involving the second year of high school was held in the form of a tea party with several tables set up in the courtyard. In this tea party, the guests to be served tea in the tea party were lounging on the first floor of the school building. For those who have servants, the servants will brew the tea here, but in Monica's case, she has to brew it herself. Since Monica would be the last one to serve tea, she had to leave in the middle of the tea ceremony and brew tea in this preparation room, but she couldn't carry a can of tea leaves to the tea ceremony. So, she decided to bring the cans into the preparation room instead. In the preparation room, a number of servants were already preparing the tea. Almost no one was wearing a uniform. Monica awkwardly sneaked into the preparation room and looked for a place to put the can of tea leaves. Um, somewhere where I won't get mixed up with other people's stuff. As she was scurrying around the preparation room, someone tapped Monica on the shoulder. Hey, why why yesh? When Monica turned around with a jittery look on her face, one of the girls was looking at Monica with a slightly surprised look. Perhaps she was surprised by Monica's exaggerated reaction. The person who tapped Monica on the shoulder was a lively girl with light brown hair. Her face was somewhat familiar to Monica. I think she is. As Monica struggled to remember her name, the brown-haired girl's face lit up when she saw Monica's face. Oh, I knew it. You must be Miss Monica Norton from the next class. I'm Casey Groove. We're in the same group today. Do you remember me? Actually, Monica couldn't remember her name very well, but she nodded her head. P please take care of me today, Lady Groove. You don't have to be so formal about it. Just call me Casey. Do you mind if I call you Monica too? As Monica blushed and nodded, Casey said, thanks, smiled pleasantly, flashing her white teeth. 
Compared to the other young ladies, she was much frank and easygoing. Casey turned her attention to the can of tea in Monica's arms. Did you come to drop off your cans, too? Me too. Casey lightly shook the light blue can in her hand. She could hear the tea leaves rustling in the can. I guess everyone sends their servants to make tea for them, after all. My family is a poor noble family in the countryside, so I didn't bring any servants with me. Indeed, Casey had no makeup and her hair was simply tied up in a bun. Her scarf and gloves were also simple and unadorned. She looked almost the same as Monica. She may not be incredibly beautiful, but she has a charming personality. She has a lively smile unlike a young lady, which was pleasing to the eye. Casey put the can of tea leaves on the shelf and put a piece of paper with her name written underneath. That way, she wouldn't have to worry about her stuff being mistaken for someone else's. Do you want some, Monica? I still have some extra paper, tea thank you. Monica took the paper hesitantly, thought about it for a moment, and then folded the edges of the paper several times to make a bellows-like crease. This way, even without writing the name as Casey did, the distinctive fold at the edge of the paper would serve as a marker. Monica placed a piece of paper with the edges folded underneath and placed three tea cans on top of it. This way, no one would mistake her thing for someone else's. Did you prepare three kinds of tea leaves? When Casey looked at Monica's can, she widened her eyes. Monica fidgeted her fingers then she answered. I, I just didn't want my choice to overlap with anyone else. Casey clapped her hands in admiration at Monica's answer. Oh, I see. I didn't realize there was such a possibility. Oh no, I hadn't even thought about what would happen if my choice overlap. You're so smart. I am not, it was Miss Isabel who gave her the idea of what to do when her choice was overlapped. While thanking Miss Isabel inwardly once again, Monica asked her the thing that had been bothering her. Oh, um, I think there's another person in our group, do you mean Miss Claudia, why yes. Do you know what kind of tea did she prepare, she had confirmed Lano's tea in advance. She was also able to confirm what Casey prepared at this moment. That left only one person remaining. It was the black-haired Miss Claudia. Since Claudia was in the same class as Casey, Monica asked her in the hope to know what kind of tea Claudia prepared, but... Casey shook her head dejectedly. Well, I'm sorry. She never talks at all in class. So I have no idea what's she thinking. Trailing off there, Casey furrowed her brow and muttered bitterly. I mean... There is no one in our class who had ever talked to her before, unsure of the meaning of Casey's words. Monica looked worried, but Casey smiled encouragingly at her. Well, let's do our best today. Why yes, P please take care of me. Casey was easy to talk to, a friendly young lady. She might even be a good friend to Lana. And yet, she felt strangely anxious about the tea party she was about to attend. What kind of person is Miss Claudia? D don't tell me. As she's like Miss Isabel said, a villainous daughter? While wondering what would happen if she gave her a high-pitched laugh when they met. Anyway, I have to face it with a strong heart, thought Monica while gulped in secret. V5C3, value of silence as Earth GT silent which May 25th, 2021 8 minutes under a pleasant autumn sky. A gorgeous tea party was being held in the courtyard. Even though it was a practical lesson, Sarandia Academy has met up its expectation as a prestigious academy. The table arrangements were top-notch, and each table was decorated with beautiful flowers, an assortment that could be compared to a tea party at the Royal Palace. If it weren't for the students in their uniforms, she might have thought it was a hall in a Royal Palace. The girls were happily talking to each other while savoring the tea they had brought. When the teacher came to do grading, the girls would start to discuss tea, tea utensils, and seasonal flowers, but once the teacher left the table, the topic would change to recent feds and gossip about their love life. Particularly, 
The topic they brought up in their discussions was mostly thing related to the student council president, Felix R. Criddle. I'm sure His Highness will choose his fiancé during his studies, who would be the most suitable, I wonder. I've heard he's very close to Lady Elian, I think Lady Bridget, who is also a member of the student council, would be a perfect match for him. The names they gave for the second prince's potential fiancé were all daughters who were at the top of this school. And yet, somewhere in the back of their minds, they were fantasizing about being chosen as the prince's fiancé. It's something that every female student at this school dreams about at least once. How wonderful it would be if that beautiful face smiled at them, or if he reaches his hand out to them. While these girls fantasizing about that, they would also satisfy their pride by sighting and looking down on the most unworthy girl for their prince. Right, speaking of the same student council members, did you hear about that girl, when one of the daughters spoke in the lowered voice behind her fan, the other daughter's eyes naturally turned stern. That girl. The girl who was elected to the student council despite being a transfer student. Monica Norton. I've heard that His Highness has been giving her some dance lessons, I saw her too. I heard she was dancing with Lord Ashley, who does she think she is, asking His Highness and Lord Ashley to teach her how to dance, she must have been some conceited country girl who forced His Highness to help her, that girl doesn't even have a servant to make her tea. Does she not have any shame, just watch her. I'm sure she'll embarrass herself in this class, hiding their malice under their beautiful fans. Those young ladies giggled at each other. The table where Monica was seated was filled with an odd atmosphere. Rather, one girl was creating that odd atmosphere. The culprit, surprisingly, was not Monica. It also was not Lana and Casey. It was Miss Claudia the most high-ranking person in the group. Claudia was a very beautiful girl. She had straight black hair and beautiful eyes that looked like they were made of lapis lazuli. Her face looked like a masterpiece that God had painstakingly created, and her beauty was no less than that of the student council secretary, Miss Bridget. If Bridget, with her golden hair and amber eyes, has a beauty that of a gorgeous, large-flowered rose, then Claudia was an iris flower of mystical beauty. Such a stunningly beautiful young lady somehow had a gloomy air about her, as if her relatives had died. Eventually, Claudia's maidservant handed out enough tea for everyone, and Claudia said with an eerie smile on her pale, lifeless face, Comma please. Help. Yourself. She smiled like a wicked witch offering poison tea to a good person who knows nothing about it. But the next moment, Claudia's face became expressionless as if a thread had been cut. Despite her expressionlessness, the gloom and lassitude that she conveyed were strangely palpable. Monica's worries about what would happen if someone laughed at her when they met were unfounded. In the first place, this gloomy young lady has neither the energy nor the motivation to smile cheerfully. Her attitude was as if she found it too much trouble to even speak. Though Monica was said to be a gloomy girl, Claudia was nothing compared to her. In Monica's case, it was due to her fear of strangers and inability to talk, but Claudia deliberately exuded a gloomy aura from her entire body that made it difficult to talk to her. That's why the atmosphere at this table was heavy and gloomy. Monica, Lana, and Casey all drank the tea that was prepared for them in silence. The tea had a nice aroma. However, due to the strange tension, she could barely taste it. Ugh, this makes me feel uneasy. This tea is so good. Hey, which tea leaves do you use? The heavy silence was cheerfully broken by Casey, a lively young lady from the next class. Sensing the subtlety of the situation, Casey smiled and spoke to Claudia in an effort to keep the mood alive. Comma it's the most popular tea in the kingdom. I don't think you need to ask, Casey's dimples tensed as she smiled. This time, Lana said in a particularly cheerful voice. H hey, I actually like milk tea. Do you have any milk? I'm not a fan of milk tea. Are you so stupid that you cannot understand that with your tongue, 
Lana's dimples tensed as she smiled. The atmosphere in that place was getting worse and worse. Monica's lips quivered as she sipped her tea, which she could barely taste. Then, with an awkward air, Casey, who was second in order, excused herself to bring the tea she had brewed and distribute it to everyone. Following her was a brightly colored tea prepared by Lana, the third in order. It was refreshing and had a fruity sweetness and freshness to it. Miss Colette's tea is delicious. It feels refreshing. I like it, Monica nodded in agreement with Casey's words, and Lana put her cup in her saucer with a look of pride on her face. Well, I've ordered the finest tea of the season, of course. Then, Lana gave a glass at Claudia. It was probably a retort to Claudia, who had prepared a plain tea. The strong will Lana did not like Claudia's attitude and had been poking at her for some time now. Monica could only watch on and flustered. Casey, the thoughtful one, somehow managed to keep the conversation going by appeasing Lana and changing the subject. In the first place, the highest ranking person is supposed to preside over such a tea party. Monica didn't know Claudia's identity, but judging from the order in charge of serving the tea, she was higher than Casey from the Count's family and Lana from the Baron's family. In other words, Claudia should be the one to provide the topic and organize the whole situation. However, Claudia, who was the heart of the matter, was indifferent, and when she opened her mouth occasionally, all she did was spoke nastily. It's hard to have a conversation with her. Comma if it started with the strongest flavors tea, it will numb the tongue. Suddenly, Claudia blurted out. Monica remembered the taste of the tea that Claudia had prepared and surprised. A tea with a familiar flavor that doesn't have any strong traits. Did she offer it as the first one, so as not to numb the tongue? Lana and Casey noticed the same thing and looked at Claudia with astonishment. Having attracted so much attention, Claudia sipped the tea that Lana had prepared, looking as if she didn't care what she said. Florendia's Golden Chips. This is the most valuable tea you can get this season, tea that's right. When Lana beakered with her, Claudia still did not look at Lana but lowered her eyelashes then muttered. If this had been an occasion to entertain a distinguished guest, it would have been the best choice, obviously inappropriate at this gathering. Though, wah, if only one person brings in an extremely valuable tea, the other participants might feel insulted, shaking and shivering, Lana's flushed red face turned pale. Then, Casey called out to Lana in a panic. D don't worry, I never think that way. Right, Monica, yes, she's right. I also never think that way, as Monica struggled to squeeze out her voice. Claudia slowly turned her head to look at Monica. Her doll-like blue eyes projected Monica's reflection without blinking. Comma if the daughter of the Count says so, I have no choice but to agree. Foo, the way she said it, it sounded as if Monica nodded because Casey had prompted her to. Monica had cried, shaking her head. And no. I I just, as Monica sobbed, Lana slammed the desk with her palm. Enough. Could you please stop with that attitude? All you do when you open your mouth is sarcasm. The most inappropriate person at this table is you. Even though Lana shouted at her bravely, Claudia did not move an eyebrow. On the contrary, she looked away, as if Lana was not worth looking at. Come you think you're worthy enough to make others speak to you, huh? As Lana raised her eyebrows and glared at Claudia. Claudia paused for a few seconds and then opened her mouth languidly. Comma have you ever heard of, silent witch, of course, she knew, that person herself was already in front of you. Monica's heart nearly stopped. Maybe it even stopped for a second. She is a genius magician who became the seventh sage at the tender age of 15. She had mastered the art of chantless magic, and in addition, had developed more than two dozen new magic formulas during her time at Minerva. However, she's famous for never having attended a conference. It was because she was afraid of crowded places and had to run for her life. Comma furthermore, Silent Witch, 
never uttered a single word during the ceremony when she was inaugurated as the Seven Sages. This was due to her shyness and social anxiety issues as well. Because Monica was so useless, her colleague Lewis Miller, barrier magician, took over all the greetings. While Monica was sweating coldly, remembering the past, Claudia continued her words without hesitation. Comma, have you ever read the article on Silent Witch? If you read it, you'll understand her personality. She's a very intelligent and wise person. I'm sure she knew the value of silence. I'm not intelligent or wise at all. I'm just a shy and gloomy person. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sitting beside Monica who had turned pale and was shaking uncontrollably, Lana glared at Claudia without hiding her displeasure. Oh, so you're saying that intelligent people don't talk to stupid people, hit Ike. No, you're wrong. I didn't mean it like that. Lana's remark was directed at Claudia, not at, silent witch, but Monica shrank back in fear. Claudia only glanced at Monica as if she didn't even hear what Lana said. That reminds me, Silent Witch, S name is Monica Everett, just like you, Monica Norton, Monica Coward. The sound of her heart was pounding loudly. Her unpleasant sweat kept flowing out. With her eyes fixed on Monica, Claudia spoke up. You've been quiet for a while now because you don't want to talk to an idiot, do you? I I I I will, e excuse myself. To prepare the tea, Monica stood up, got out of her seat to flee from that place. And Claudia's blue eyes kept staring at that small back of her. No one noticed that since the beginning of this tea party, Claudia, who had always had a downcast look, had only looked at one person. V5C4, a cup of something inappropriate as Earth GT silent which May 27th. 2021 nine minutes as she walked quickly through the corridor, Monica squeezed her heart, which was racing, over her uniform. Don't tell me, don't tell me she's noticed? She's noticed that I'm the silent witch. After becoming one of the seven sages, she had mostly kept her face hidden, so the only people who knew Monica's face were her fellow seven sages. Or perhaps they were acquaintances from her days at Minerva? But Monica, who was extremely socially awkward, was mostly confined herself inside the lab, and if she had seen a beautiful woman as conspicuous as Claudia somewhere, she would remember her for sure. I, it's just a coincidence, right? It just happened that she brought that topic up. It must be. Telling herself as much, Monica opened the door to enter the preparation room. Compared to before the tea ceremony has started, there were fewer people. Almost all the maids were probably out serving the guests at the tea ceremony. Slightly relieved by the least number of people, Monica turned to the shelf where she had placed her cans before. Uh, looking up at the shelf, Monica stiffened. Monica's can of tea leaves were missing. Casey's can of tea leaves was in the same position as Monica remembered. But the space next to it, where Monica had placed her cans, was empty. She was certain, though, that she had laid out a folded paper and put three cans on top of it. Feeling a bad premonition, Monica's blood drained from her body. This was not the first time Monica had been faced with this kind of situation. Just like what she had guessed. With trembling hands, Monica lifted the lid of the trash can. Come on, mixed in with the used tea husks and empty cans. Were unused tea leaves strewn all over in the trash she also found her folded paper. How could my, Monica crouched down on the spot helplessly. Without the tea leaves, she would not be able to make tea. This means she can't continue her lesson. What should I do? Tears slowly welled up in her eyes. No matter how good a magician Monica might be, she can't rewind time. As she swallowed a sob and sniffled. She heard a familiar voice behind her. What's wrong, Monica? Are you not feeling well? Casey kneeled down beside Monica and rubbed her back. When Monica asked her in a faint voice why she was here, Casey scratched her cheek with a complicated look. I was worried about you because you hadn't come back, so I came to check on you. Guess not. Sorry, 
To be honest, it was hard for me to stay there. Well, she apparently couldn't stand the tense atmosphere between Lana and Claudia and slipped out of her seat under the pretense of going to check on Monica. Casey looked at the tea leaves strewn all over in the trash can and seemed to grasp the situation. She furrowed her brow and stared at the trash can. Horrible, who would do such things? Casey then wiped Monica's tears with a handkerchief and spoke to her in a gentle tone, as if she were a young child. Hey, do you have any spare tea leaves in the dorm? I think you could serve some tea you usually drink, I don't have any. Since Monica did not drink tea in general, she never stocked it up. If she asked Miss Isabel, she might be willing to share it again, but she's in the middle of her class now. While Monica sniffled softly, Casey thought for a moment before taking her own tea can. Just use my tea leaves. I know this means we'll serve the same type of tea, but better than ending up with nothing to serve, but... I, I can't trouble you. If they serve the same tea, it will be evaluated as a lack of prior preparation. Then, not only Monica, but Casey would receive a point deduction as well. But Casey was just as nonchalant, waving her hands dismissively. Don't worry about that. I don't care what kind of tea served at a tea party, as long as it's tasty and enjoyable, then that's all that matters, stopping her sniffling. Monica then looked at the tea leaves in the trash can. Casey was certainly right. Most importantly, if she returned to the tea party without being able to prepare the tea, she might fail her lesson. But, Monica clenched her fists and stood up on shaky legs. She then turned around before ran out of the preparation room. Monica, where are you going? I am sorry, I'll be back soon, after left saying that. Monica started running off to her room in the dormitory. Lana stared at Claudia in annoyance as she bit on the butter cake. Claudia seemed to be staring at the departing Monica, but the atmosphere returned to gloomy as soon as she was out of sight. Her long black eyelashes lowered as she stared at her cup of tea, making her beauty look so delicate. And yet, the gloom and unapproachability she exuded were amazing in their own way. What is this? What is this? What is this? Lana bit her lip then looked down at the cup of tea she had served. Although wealthy, Lana's father was not born noble. Even he was from a wealthy merchant family, because of his contributions to the development of the city, he was given a peerage shortly before Lana was born. Lana had been raised with the finest luxuries and trendy dresses for as long as she could remember. Everyone said Lana was a blessed young lady but Lana was lonely. Among the children of families without titles, the blessed Lana always felt out of place. She didn't fit in well with the other children and was accused of bragging about her riches. That's why she thought she would be able to make friends similar to her own if she entered Serendia Academy where most of the noble children attended. However, in a school where lineage and prestige matter, Lana was treated as the daughter of a wealthy family with no refinement. To top it all off, her father was accused of having bought his title with money. You have no sense of decency, no sense of manners, no understanding of the unspoken rules of nobility. The more someone said those words to her, the more Lana became stubborn. When Lana first approached Monica, it was only on a whim. Since Monica was not as good as her and stood out in class, taking care of her satisfied Lana's pride a little. Above all, although Monica tended to hang her head down, when Lana offered her a little help she would smile like a blooming small flower. This tickled sensation made Lana can't leave her alone. Whenever Monica looked at Lana with respect, Lana's heart was slightly filled with joy. In fact, she was expecting Monica's adoring gaze at today's tea party. She even had chosen the tea leaves with great enthusiasm, but Claudia pointed out that they were inappropriate, and Lana's pride was in tatters. Why does it always have ended up this way? All I wanted was, to give my friend the best tea I could. It brought back memories of her childhood when she served the best pastries and tea to her friends she invited to her house only to be criticized for bragging about being rich behind her back. 
Lana simply wanted to give her friend the most wonderful thing to eat. Well, sorry for the long wait. Casey, who had been absent, quickly came back. But Monica was not standing next to her. Lana asked with her eyes, where's Monica? Casey scratched her cheek with a vague expression and took a seat. Hmm, well, I think she'll come here soon. You weren't helping Monica prepare tea, were you? In response to Lana's question, Casey muttered crisply, No, it's, what exactly is going on? Did something happen to Monica? As Lana sat up, a soft, pleasant smell tickled her nose. But it was not the smell of tea. Tea thank you, for waiting, with her unreliable wobbling feet, in an almost dangerous, Monica approached the table. On the tray in her hands were an empty cup and an unfamiliar pot. Monica placed the tray on the table and wiped the sweat from her forehead. It seemed that just carrying the tray up there was a big task for the non-athletic Monica. Claudia, who had been looking unenthusiastic, slowly raising up her head then stared at the pot. Comma it doesn't smell like tea, this, is a coffee. Looking straight at Claudia, Monica said in a shaky voice. L Lady Claudia. Since you said, if you start the party with something of a strong flavor, it will numb your tongue. So, since I am the last, having coffee with a strong taste should not be a problem. Coffee is a drink for men. I don't think it's appropriate for a women's tea party. What Claudia said was correct. Coffee has indeed become quite popular in this country, and while coffee houses do exist, it is mostly men who drink them. Above all, coffee has a strong bitter and sour taste, making it difficult to please everyone. Although Lana had tried it a few times, she was not very fond of it. But then again, Monica said firmly, which was unusual for her. D don't worry. I think it will taste delicious. So, she then poured the coffee from the pot into the cups and added warm milk to the three cups. As since it is meant to be drunk as a palate cleanser after a meal, I really want people to drink it as is, but I know many people don't like bitterness, so I add milk to your cup. You can add more sugar if you like. After the cups were handed out to all of them, Claudia was the first to lift her cup. After smelling at the aroma, she sipped it. Comma Claudia's unresponsive attitude did scare her a little. Both Lana and Casey added sugar to their cups before sipped timidly. What's this? There's no bitterness or sourness at all, muttering. Lana sipped the contents of the cup once more. The mellowness of the milk enveloped the refreshing bitterness. That was a flavor that Lana had never tasted before. Casey was also looking at the cup closely, surprised. Hey, I've never had this kind of coffee before, is it supposed to be this easy to drink? It was understandable for Casey to say that. Speaking of coffee, until a long time ago, it used to be made by boiling down ground beans then added with sugar. But, after siphons and other tools have become popular recently, many flavorful coffees have been appearing. Still, the coffee that Monica prepared was more than flavorful. Claudia gazed at the silver pot then muttered. Comma coffee tastes more bitter the longer it is brewed. Why yes. That's why I use this pot to make a quick extraction. This pot uses steam power to brew coffee in a short time. I've never seen this appliance before. Not even in a book. At Claudia's muttering, Lana and Casey widened their eyes. Claudia was probably the most knowledgeable person here. No, perhaps at this school. Having born in the lineage of a family that had such a vast amount of knowledge. She was nicknamed as Walking Library, and for someone like her, how could there's nothing she did not know about? Claudia drank the contents of her cup cleanly and looked at Monica with blue eyes that were still unreadable. I see, not a bad way to catch me off guard. But this is a tea ceremony class, remember? A drink that isn't even tea is completely out of that category, W well, I think so. B but. Monica looked down and picked up her own cup. Her cup was the only one that did not have milk in it. She was probably used to drinking bitter coffee. I. I wanted my dearest friend to drink what I love the most. So. Um. 
wearing both of her hands around her cup, Monica lowering her eyebrows then smiled. Comma, I guess I'm the most inappropriate here. As Monica smiled shyly, Lana felt as if her mind was going blank. What is this? What is this? What is this? Lana thought that her tea was the most inappropriate at this table, but now Monica brought in coffee that was more inappropriate for a tea party. She would probably get a point deduction. Lana gulped down the contents of her cup. It's really good. I like it a lot, said Lana as she tried to hold back her tears, looking at Monica's smile which still looks like a blooming flower. The 5C5 Suspicious I as Earth GT silent which May 28, 2021 Six minutes that night after the tea party lesson in the courtyard ended, Monica was working on her report in her attic room. Getting point deduction was a matter of fact after serving coffee at the tea party. Since Lana and Casey negotiated a lot with the teacher, the teacher didn't deduct all her points, instead, they made her write a report. Beside Monica, who was writing her report, was Nero licking a cup of coffee with plenty of milk poured in. In his cat form, Nero dexterously clutching a small cup with his paws, sticking his face into the cup. Phew, this thing is not bad. So this is what a grown man tastes like. Grown men won't pour so much sugar and milk into their drinks. Exasperated at his comment, she finished her report then put back her quill pen at its place then let out a deep sigh. Recalling her tea leaves that had thrown into the trash can, Monica was certain it was an intentional act to harass her. These things will keep occurring from now on, won't they? Their hatred toward Monica will keep increasing day by day for sure. But, what Claudia did hurts her head even more. Nero, oh, what's up, I just wondering, maybe someone knew my true identity as the silent witch. Raising his head from the cop, Nero with his whiskers smeared in milk, said. Wanna do night escape, why did you always make such a decision, well, if your identity discovered, Lululu Lumpur will kill you, won't he, it's Louis. Please remember it, will you, while Nero was licking his cop, Monica pondered. If her identity discovered, she will be forced to end this undercover mission. Lewis might give her a smile of indignation, but she will back to her quiet daily days, hiding back herself in the cabin, reading and calculating formula as she pleased. Without worrying about her social life. Even so, why she can't honestly happy about that? Um. My identity hadn't been discovered for certain. So I guess I will keep an eye just to make sure, feeling Monica's unwillingness, Nero narrowed his golden eyes then said, oh, really in a teasing manner. If this you a while ago, you would have cried out, I had enough I can't I wanna go home ug. W well, you might be right, but, while Monica fidgeting with her finger, Nero leaped onto Monica's lap, tapping at Monica's thigh. His gesture was like that of humans who consoles their acquaintance. Why but? If you've got a little bit of an attachment to this place, I don't think that's a bad thing, is that, all right? Yeah, you're right, Nero was right. For Monica, this school was no longer a place filled with only bad memories. Although not many, she has friends, who would lend her a hand when she's in trouble. That was something new for Monica, who had previously shut herself off from socializing. But, that timid and clumsy Monica Norton was only her temporary identity. Eventually, when her mission is over, Monica will leave the school and return to her life in the cabin. When that happened, she would never see the people she had met at this school as Monica Norton again. And Monica will return back to be Monica Everett of the Seven Sages, Silent Witch. One week after the tea party, Monica was completely at loss. As soon as lunch break came, Monica hurriedly left the classroom. Even though she was the first one to leave the classroom, she still couldn't let her guard down. After looking around restlessly, Monica took a large stride to leave the school building. This should be fine, right? Thought Monica while raising her gaze, but then she saw a figure with black hair stood in the shade of a water fountain, 
only to make her let a little gasp. It was Claudia. When she standing near the water fountain, her figure was like a figurine, but when she noticed Monica, she only turned her gaze, staring intensely at her. She's been like that all this week. Claudia would appear wherever Monica went, only to stare at her from a distance. She never came close or talked to her. All she did was looking at her, which was made her behavior would only look creepier. When Monica hurriedly trying to head to the back of the school building. Bam she bumped into someone and fell on her butt. I am sorry, while holding her nose that bumped into, Monica raised her gaze, then found Glenn looking at her with widened eyes. Monica, are you okay? I, I'm sorry, even in her apologizing, Monica still trying to find a place to hide. And Glenn, who looked at Monica's state, muttered, oh, as if he had figured something. You're being followed by someone, aren't you? W well, something like that, all right, let me help you. Glenn held Monica lightly by his side, chanted a short incantation then kicked the ground. With Monica in his arm, Glenn floated up with a flight spell, jumped onto a fairly thick tree, then released the spell. Now they won't catch you so easily here. This is my favorite place to take a nap, thank. Thank you, just when Monica about to thank him. She saw someone down walking toward the tree. It's Claudia. She walked near the tree then quietly passing by, or so they thought. Instead she stopped her foot right in front of the tree where they're up there. In a spur moment, Monica used her no-chance spell to create a wind gust aiming at the tree not far from her. By swaying the tree a little should have to move Claudia's attention. And Claudia was staring at the swaying tree below the tree where's Monica up there. Come is it just my imagination, Claudia muttered to herself, then went deeper into the backyard of the school building. After making sure her figure disappeared, Monica sighed out quietly, and Glenn relaxed his brows then looked at Monica. Are you being bullied by that person, and no. I'm not being bullied by her. I'm just being followed by her, in that case, you'd better speak up clearly. If you feel uncomfortable saying it, I'll say it for you, okay, T thanks, but, I'm fine, since no real harm has been done. She can't denounce Claudia yet. What's more, Claudia might be aware of Monica's true identity. If she cornered Claudia, she might tell everyone that Monica was the silent witch, and it would be a disaster. She's probably trying to keep an eye on me to see if I'm really the silent witch. If Claudia was completely sure, she wouldn't be monitoring Monica like this. Then, it's better to stay quiet until Claudia gives up. Afterward, Monica asked Glenn to take her down from the tree, being asked, Wanna grill some meat with me, but politely declined before heading back to the school building. In the end, she used all her lunch break time. Although she's used to skipping her meals, after having run away from Claudia all this time, she was completely tired. I wish to enjoy my meal peacefully, thought Monica as she let out a sigh but a few girls stood in front of her classroom, blocking her way into. May I have your time, Miss Norton? The person who approached Monica was a blonde-haired young lady who seemed to be in the same grade. Because Monica can't recall her face, they should probably from a different class. Monica was taking precautions but only to be responded with a smirk from that young lady. I am Caroline Simons from the house of the Count Norn. I'd like to invite you to my tea party. Tea, party, indeed. Class ended a little early today, doesn't it? So, before you do your student council work, why don't you come to my tea party? I've been wanting to get along with you for a long time. Judging from the atmosphere, the leader of this group should be Miss Caroline. Monica didn't know much about the house of Count Norn, but they should be a prestigious family in their own right. So, unless Monica's got something important to do, she won't be able to refuse her invitation. No, I don't want to go, suppressing her whining thought, in a shaky voice, Monica responded to her. As, as long as it won't interfere with my duty on the student council, 
Of course. It won't take a long time. Caroline smiled happily and asserting, Right, everyone, while exchanging looks with the girls around her. The other girls looked at Monica observantly, while affirming Caroline's words. A blatant look of disdain in their eyes spoke more eloquently than anything else, treating Monica as a shabby girl. If she could, she would refuse her invitation. But she can't create any ruckus that would make her stand out in the school. Okay. I'll be fine, just drink the tea without saying anything needlessly until the end. I will be fine. While Monica desperately thought those words to herself, a pair of blue eyes like lapis lazuli was gazing intensely at her figure, and Monica hasn't noticed it. V5 C6, Sinner Azareth GT Silent which May 30th. 2021 6 minutes Caroline's designated venue for the tea party was set in the courtyard tea table where the tea party practical lesson had been held the other days. The current weather was nice, so many of the ladies seemed to have tea parties here, and in addition to the table Monica was ushered to, there were several other table sets available for people to spend time at their own leisure. With all these people watching, it's unlikely that they'll be ganging up on her in an obvious way or splashing tea over her head. Feeling a little relieved by this, Monica took her seat. Besides Monica, three other young ladies seated at the table. Caroline was seated facing Monica. Caroline was a young lady with big, bright eyes. Though she was the same age as Monica, she was more mature and had a glamorous air about her. Huh? Why these people's eyes were? Under the bright courtyard with the afternoon sun, Monica felt a small sense of discomfort. But before Monica could mention her discomfort, Caroline's chambermaid handed out the tea. Smiling, Caroline sipped her tea. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here today, Miss Norton. Tea thank you for inviting me, Monica, who has trouble making eye contact with anyone kept her head down before speaking in hushed tones. It made the young ladies next to her giggle behind their fans. Their laughter, like a chorus of series of small chuckles, was strangely disturbing. And yet, when Carolina opened her mouth, it stopped. Where do you come from, Miss Norton, Renak, my, then perhaps you're related to the Count's Kerbeck family, Monica thought back to the setting Lewis Miller had come up with. According to his settings, she was the adopted daughter of the former countess. Then, it would be safe to say that she's related to the Count Kerbeck family. Why yes. The Count and his family have been very kind to me. Monica admired herself for being able to respond so well. Despite her timidness and stuttering, she has made unbelievable progress compared to the Monica of the past. After all, she now was able to hold a conversation. As Monica was thinking about this, the lady right next to her opened her mouth. Say, Miss Norton. What do you usually discuss with a student council president? Tip. Well, it just, about, in fact, Monica never spoke to Felix, except when it came to student council activities. Sometimes Felix tried to initiate the conversation with Monica but she would just tell herself that she was a rock and sit quietly whenever he did. I envy you being able to serve by His Highness' side, indeed, you can see His Highness' face every day, after all, the young ladies gazed up into the air in fascination and let out a longing sigh. As Monica watched the scene, she was deeply impressed by the power of the golden ratio in attracting people's hearts. What would be the result if you put a golden ratio sculpture and a non-golden ratio sculpture side by side and took statistics to see which one was more desirable? Thinking vaguely about this, Monica lifted the cup. When that happened, Caroline and the others lifted their fans in unison to cover their mouths. Is this, a basic move of a villainess that Lady Isabel told me recently? The chorus of giggles coming from behind the fan had a precision that could only be a result of training. It was neither too loud nor too quiet, and the nastiness of the laughter that disturbed her ears was quite exquisite. I see, so this is that move, while admiring something out of place, Monica sipped from her cup of tea. 
The taste of the tea in her mouth was rather bitter. It was not astringent, but bitter. I wonder if this tea is supposed to have a taste like this. It was bitter, to say the least, but not undrinkable. Monica, who was accustomed to drinking bitter coffee regularly, felt a little uncomfortable with the tea, but she drank it. Immediately, the color of the ladies' faces changed. Him? Is there something wrong with me? The ladies peeled their eyes open and looked at Monica as if they were looking at something uncanny. Their faces looked pale. Monica took another sip of the intensely bitter tea to cover her impatience, wondering if she had done something wrong. Miss Caroline made a small awe sound. Huh? Her pounding heart sounded awfully loud. Her vision blurred and distorted, and their figures became blurred. Did she drink it? Are you kidding me? That tea is so bitter, you know. Oh, my God. I was expecting her to choke herself. The ladies were saying something quickly to each other in dismay. Their voices were certainly reaching Monica's ears, but her mind could not perceive their words. Their voices slipped through her ears as nonsensical sounds. What is happening? Her world distorted mushily. Distorting, zooming, blurring, melting finally dyed by the tea color. No, this red was not a color of the tea. This red was a fire. And behind the flickering fire was a silhouette of a person. Comma Dad, the figure of her father, tied to a tree, was fading into the flames. An unpleasant smell pervaded her nose. It was the smell of burning human flesh. Ah! Ah! The people surrounding her father raised their voices. Comma heretic. You damn heretic. You damn blasphemous sinner. Comma no, my father has done nothing wrong. Someone threw something into the burning fire. It was a huge amount of records that her father had written with all his might before he died. No, no, don't burn it. Please don't burn it. The numbers were burning. The beautiful numbers and records that have been accumulated over the years were burned, turning to ashes in an instant. I must memorize it, all of it. I must memorize all of the numbers that my father left me. Monica stared intently at the records of the numbers being thrown at her without taking her eyes off the burning flames. With Monica's unreliable eyesight, she could only see fragmentary numbers in the vast amount of data. Nevertheless, Monica burned the numbers she saw into her mind. I have to remember it. I have to remember the records that my father left behind, even just a little bit. The numbers she burned into her eyes were all left by her father. She would never forget them. They were the proof of her father's life. Comma 18,473,726, 385, 20,985.726. 29,405.84739, 235, 2,108,877, 25, all you do is talk about numbers. It's disgusting. Stop talking nonsense. I'm sorry, uncle. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, because of my brother's stupid research, I now have to suffer the consequences. How can I be in business when I've got a criminal in my family? Stop screwing around. No, my father has done nothing wrong. My father is. You've got to be kidding me. Try saying that shit outside. I'll beat you with an iron rod. I'm sorry, uncle. Please don't hit me. Please don't hit me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't say any more unnecessary things in public. I'll keep my mouth shut, so don't hit me, don't hit me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The courtyard was in an uproar. Monica Norton suddenly fell out of her chair, fainting in agony. Her face was pale and she was breathing unnaturally, choking up and mumbling incomprehensible words in between. Caroline and the others who were sitting with her looked at Monica as if they were looking at something uncanny. In the midst of all this, a young lady quickly approached their table. It was a tall, beautiful woman with straight black hair, Claudia. Claudia wordlessly kneeled down in front of Monica and checked on her condition. 
Comma what did you give to her? At Claudia's words, Caroline shook her head and exclaimed in a shrill voice. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know anything. Standing up quietly, Claudia closed the distance between her and Caroline, like a snake was creeping up on her, then shoved her hands into her pockets. Her hand was searching for something. Come out and I drop. No. Give it back. Don't touch my things without permission. Hideike. When Caroline was screaming, Claudia silently grabbed her by the mouth. She then placed her other hand near Caroline's eyes. Claudia then lifted Caroline's makeup tinted eyelids forcefully and closely examined her eyes. Your pupils are enlarging. I guess it's belladonna or a similar poison. This is just an eye drop that makes your eyes look bigger. It's poison. After Claudia crisply dismissed Caroline's reasoning with a single sentence, she then fixed her eyes straight on Caroline's enlarging pupils, declared her statement. You, poison that girl. No. I just, want to have her choke up after drinking a bitter tea. I mean, how could I know that she would drink up something that bitter? That girl just is crazy. Claudia did not look at Caroline anymore but kneeled down beside Monica. She then raised Monica's upper body and plunged her fingers into her mouth. Come on, ugh, throw it up. Even though Claudia stimulated the back of her throat, Monica couldn't vomit it properly, only convulsing. Claudia clicked her tongue and gave instructions to those watching in the distance. Somebody, bring me diluted saline water and some milk and contact the infirmary and student council members. The 5 c 7 ah, the height Azareth GT silent which May 31st, 2021 13 minutes when Monica recalled her memories about her father, the only thing she could remember was his back figure. His figure who was facing the table throughout the days as a researcher. Dad. Dad. Hoping that he could turn his gaze to her. The young Monica could only reach out her hand toward his back figure, only to pull her hand back. She understood her father was doing an important job, that's why she didn't want to bother him. But, as if he heard Monica's inner voice, he stopped his writing hand, then turned his gaze at Monica. Behind his glasses put on his face full of beard were the calm eyes of an intelligent person. Her father always has a calm demeanor. Her father reached out the hand she was pulling back, and wrapped it around with both of his hands. That made Monica happy, too unable to hold her voices. Comma E. Dad. Him? Am I really that old? Your Highness, there's no need to listen to this little girl's nonsense. Oh, I thought you're going to wake her up with a slap. W.L. I mean, this girl is sick. A familiar voice came from just above her. Monica groaned softly before opening her eyes. Apparently, she was on a bed in the infirmary. It was the same place she had been taken to before. Monica found two figures standing beside her sleeping bed. Sparkling in the slightest light, it's honey blonde and platinum blonde. Your Highness Anne. Lord Ashley, Felix Ark Riddle, the student council president, and Cyril Ashley, the vice president. The one that grasping Monica's hand was Felix. Why are these two people here? Why is Felix holding on to Monica's hand? Monica's mind, which had begun to slowly awaken, vaguely recalled the events that had led her to this point. If I recall correctly, my head felt dizzy after drank that bitter tea. From that point on, the rest of her memory was very vague. She felt like having a nightmare. You were drugged by the daughter of Count Norn at the tea party. Being poisoned, you were in a terrible stupor, comma Monica paled quickly and pulled her own hand out of Felix's. She then rolled off the bed and forced her still weak body to place her forehead against the floor. Hey, little girl, what are you doing? Cyril sounded surprised and tried to get Monica to stand up. But Monica remained to prostrate on the floor her motionless lips quivering as she squeezed out the words. Come I apologize, for any inconvenience. I may, have caused you. As soon as she said the word, she felt nauseated by it. Her head was spinning and she felt dizzy. Still, 
she felt she had to apologize. Because Monica had ruined the tea party and caused a commotion, that's all. I apologize, for not able to live up as the student council members. Tears welled up in her eyes as she apologized. Somehow, the back of her eyes was extremely hot. Tears spilled from her tear glands, which had become even looser than usual. Miss Norton, please raise your head. Felix dropped to his knees and stroked Monica's hair. But Monica couldn't raise her head. They must be so disappointed in her, thinking she's an ignorant person who can't even behave properly at a tea party. There were so many things she could think of to blame herself for. As she was grinding her own heart out, thinking of endless words to blame herself with, a hand plunged into Monica's armpit. That hand lifted Monica like lifting a kitten. Hey! How dare you make His Highness kneel before you? It was Cyril who lifted Monica up. Ah, because of her inability to conduct herself, Lord Ashley got mad at her again, thought Monica sobbingly only responded with a grunt by Cyril. You're a victim. Why would a victim apologizing, be but, a sick person with a deathly complexion shouldn't talk nonsense. Next time you get out of bed without permission, I'll tie you to the bed with a rope. Cyril raised his eyebrows as he made a rather frightening declaration. My, what are you raving about in the infirmary? My dear brother, the curtain dividing the bed swung revealing nothing but a beautiful face. Straight black hair and lapis lazuli eyes. A young lady with beautiful looks and a gloomy atmosphere, she was Claudia. Brother? Cyril stared at Claudia with a startled look on his face, then bent his lips into a frown and fell silent. Felix, on the other hand, gave Claudia a beaming smile. Miss Claudia Ashley, thanks to your excellent first aid, a student was saved. As student council president, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, it's my pleasure to help. For some reason, Claudia looked uncomfortable even though she was being thanked by the prince of this country. At this attitude, which could be taken as disrespectful, Cyril raised his eyebrows. His Highness has honored you with his compliments. You should show a little more appreciation. Oh my. You want me to wag my tail like a praised, stupid dog like someone did. Claudia managed to pull off a clever move of snickering with a blank expression on her face. As expected, the attitude that struck a nerve in most people made Cyril propped his veins. Who are you calling a dog? No one said anything about you, my dear brother. My, what's wrong with your face? I had tried to carry the sick Monica Norton in my arms. But because of my lack of strength, after halfway through, I ran out of energy, so I asked the president to take over, that is. My dear brother, at the words spoken in an indifferent voice, Cyril turned red, then pale, and finally, his face turned completely white. He simply felt so pathetic. Come I'm sorry, if I'm heavy, as Monica did her best to follow up, Cyril crunched and gnashed his teeth. But he didn't say anything. What should I do thought Monica in fluster, and Felix stroked Monica's cheek. You're not heavy. In fact, I'm surprised you're so light. You need to eat a little more, why yes. After Felix put Monica's blanket back on, he turned his attention to Cyril. Well, I guess we shouldn't stay too long in a woman's infirmary. We'll be leaving soon, Cyril's expression which had been drawn out by Claudia, returned and he nodded yes to Felix's words. Then he glanced at Monica and told her, Monica Norton, you don't have to come to the student council room today. If you do, consider that you have no work to do there, you should go back to your dormitory and get a good rest. With that, Cyril and Felix turned their backs on Monica. Claudia took a handkerchief out of her pocket and fluttered it around to show him off. With a blank expression, of course. This blatant attitude of Claudia's made Cyril's temples tighten. Claudia. Keep an eye on that little girl to make sure she doesn't slip out of infirmary to come to the student council room. Oh my, if you're worried, why didn't you just say so? You looked at Monica Norton's sleeping face with great concern. 
My dear brother, Cyril was shaking all over and Felix was chuckling at the interaction between the two siblings as they walked out of the infirmary. After they left, the infirmary instantly became quiet. Monica gathered her courage and spoke to Claudia. Um. T thank you very much for your help with the first aid. How far do you remember? Up to the point where I drank the tea. After that, all she could remember was that she was having a nightmare. The next thing she knew, she was on a bed in the infirmary. Claudia sat down in a nearby chair and brushed back her long black hair. The tea was laced with a pupil enlarging eye drop. An eye drop? Ah, that's why, even though it's a bright place, their pupils were. Monica had felt uncomfortable with Caroline ever since she had confronted her at the tea party in the courtyard. Normally, when someone was in a brightly lit place, their pupils become smaller in order to regulate the amount of light entering your eyes. However, Caroline's pupils were wide open. Um, did Lady Caroline have an eye disease? Those eye drops are for cosmetic purposes. The idiots who blindly believe that the bigger your pupils are, the more beautiful you are, will get involved with those eye drops without knowing their side effects. The eye drops Caroline was carrying were originally intended to be used for eye diseases. As long as they are used in the proper dosage, they are not a problem, but if used in the wrong way, they can be poisonous. And, she put it into Monica's teacup. Those eye drops were laced with a mixture of ingredients that made them very bitter. They were planning to make you a laughing stock by making you choke from drinking the tea laced with it. That's why Caroline had chosen the more crowded courtyard. The whole idea was to ridicule Monica in front of the crowd as she choked uncomfortably as she drank her tea. However, what Caroline miscalculated was the fact that Monica drank it down. That, uh, was bitter but it wasn't undrinkable. What do you think the creature's sense of taste is for? It's not for savoring delicious food. It's to distinguish between flavors and avoid the dangers of toxins. Monica was scolded in a roundabout way for not being able to avoid danger, and she fell silent. She might not have been careful enough, that was for sure. But the fact that Caroline and the others had bad intentions toward her was quite obvious so she shouldn't have said anything at all. Claudia mentioned that Monica couldn't vomit the poison properly, so they forced her to drink diluted salt water to make her vomit the poison. When she had emptied her stomach, she was given milk to protect the mucous membrane of her stomach. The contents of your stomach were almost empty when I made you vomit. Judging by your appearance, you're underweight for your age, and I don't feel you're trying to maintain your health. Ugh, she couldn't eat her lunch today was because she running away from Claudia. Still, the way Claudia pointed out Monica's lack nutrition has similarity to Rosalie's was painful to hear. Looking Monica's hanging down her head downheartedly, Claudia spoke to her in the same indifferent tone. The smaller figure of that person, the less poison the dose to be lethal. Poisons that are not lethal to a normal adult figure person can be lethal to a child figure person. You've almost lost your life, a child figure person, laying back on the bed, Monica fixed her gaze at Claudia. She was a slender, but tall, beautiful woman who showed off her curves. It was hard to believe that she was the same age as Monica. Although she had never had much of a complex about her figure, since befriending Lana and Casey, Monica had grown concerned about her childish appearance, if only slightly. As Monica was getting secretly stricken with defeat, Claudia leaned forward to look into Monica's face. Comma oh my, what's the matter, child girl? You're staring at me so intensely, child girl. Just so you know, don't take any solid food today. You're going to throw up, child girl. Why you don't have keep saying child girl child girl to me? Because I don't want you to thank me for saving your life. Hearing Claudia's words, Monica widened her eyes. Come to think of it, she also looked disgusted when Felix thanked her. Monica felt grateful to Claudia, of course, she won't give her thanks to her. But, her response was not that of a person who hide their embarrassment, but unpleasant. Um. 
Is it because you don't like me, that you don't want to be thanked? Being asked in a shaky voice, Claudia straightened her posture. Her doll-like expression remained unchanged. However, there was a dark emotion, slightly different from malice, that swayed slightly in the depths of her lapis lazuli eyes. It's not that I dislike you, neither do I like you. When Claudia exhaled wearily, Monica boldly asked her. T then. Why, do you keep following me, for the past week? Monica had always thought that it was because Claudia suspected her of identity as the silent witch. But Claudia, slidered like a snake, closed the distance soundlessly, looked into Monica's face and whispered faintly. Comma it's because you seduced my fiancé. Huh. As Monica's mouth agape, Claudia continued her words without hesitation. If it were just a matter of being on the same student council, that wouldn't matter to me. But how could I allow anyone to even practice dancing with him? Even I've never had him dance with me, a student council member, dancing practice. From these two keywords, the first thing that came to Monica's mind was Felix and Cyril. But since she and Cyril were siblings, the answer was obviously narrowed. Don't tell me, His Highness is her. It was reassuring to know that Claudia hadn't discovered her true identity. But never did she think that Felix's fiancé would misunderstand her for trying to seduce him. This misunderstanding had to be settled as soon as possible. The only thing Monica thought about Felix was that he had a body with a golden ratio. As Monica was pondering how to hide the fact that she was on an escort mission and clear up Claudia's misunderstanding, she heard the door to the infirmary open. Manikria. I've come to Visayat. SSH. SSH. Don't shout in the infirmary. Those familiar, buzzing voices were from Glenn and Neil. Without asking, Glenn opened the curtains and approached the bed with his big toe. Monica, are you okay? Your face looks so pale. Oh, I came to visit you. Is it okay if I bring you some meat? You can't give meat to someone who'd just been poisoned. Neil, who chided Glenn smiled somewhat awkwardly when he noticed Claudia sitting there on the side of the bed. Oh, Miss Claudia, good day to you. Claudia's face was expressionless. However, the air she wore had clearly changed. The depressed and languid air has disappeared completely. Neil looked slightly troubled at Claudia, who was staring at him with a blank expression. Well, I heard from the student council president. He told me that you gave first aid to Miss Norton, Miss Claudia, as expected. Claudia was silent and expressionless. She didn't even have a single word to say. Neil lowered his eyebrows in trouble, but tried his best to continue speaking. You are indeed a remarkable woman, Miss Claudia. That's amazing, right? At that moment, Monica was sure she saw it. Muttering in a faint voice. The corners of Claudia's mouth lifted up, only slightly. Even though she looked uncomfortable when Felix praised her, Claudia now showed a slight hint of happiness. Could it be, her fiancé is? When Monica finally realized this fact, Glenn said, Ah, and stared at Claudia with a loud voice. This woman. She has been following Monica around before, eh? Following around, at Glenn's comment. Neil whined in her his eyes in surprise. Then Claudia, quieter than a snake, stood up, and slid over to Monica's bed. That's a misunderstanding. We're friends, after all, this was news to her. If anything, Claudia just told her that she neither dislikes nor likes her, or that she has a child figure. But Claudia nimbly grabbed Monica's hand who had dumbfounded expression and said, Comma right? We're friends. Right? Monica, what a brilliant change of heart. As Monica stunned, Claudia stared at her with lapis lazuli eyes. Monica was overwhelmed by the pressure of her silence. Why yes, Monica nodded stiffly, and Claudia said, See, then looked at Glenn and Neil. Comma besides, I'm Neil's fiancé. Are you questioning your friend's fiancé? What? Fiancé? You're Neil's fiancé. Neil vaguely laughs at Glenn's loud yelling. Well, 
The engagement was just something that our parents decided on their own. Oh, are you not pleased being engaged with me? Claudia turned her doll-like face to Neil. The fact that her face was so well-defined gave her a strange sense of intimidation, even without an expression. Neil's face tensed up and he shook his head. No, no, it's not like that. If anything, I feel like I'm not good enough for you, Miss Claudia, but, well, Neil's eyes kept glancing at the top of Claudia's head. At that moment, the inner voices of Monica and Glenn overlapped. Ah their height. Neil was slightly smaller than most boys his age. Claudia, on the other hand, was considered tall for a woman. Their height difference was apparent to everyone. Walking down the corridor, Felix retracted his unusually soft smile. Doing so made his brilliant and extremely beautiful face stand out even more. Having felt a quiet irritation from Felix, Cyril, who was walking behind him, also wore a quiet expression on his face. As Felix walked, he silently confronted the frustration within himself. Oh, what a mess. I am someone who prefers not to lose my temper. The emotion of anger inside of him was supposed to be directed at the right person at the right time. It's not something that should be vented here. Still, the image of Monica from earlier clawed back into Felix's mind. Come I apologize, for not able to live up as the student council members. The figure of the girl, who was trembling a little with tears in her eyes, overlapped with that of the young boy. Come I apologize for not able to live up as the royal family. Really, the figure of that girl is similar to me. Quietly confirming this, Felix spoke up. This whole thing is making me a little angry. Cyril's expression tightened at Felix's unusually cold words. I have the ringleader, the daughter of Count Norn, and the other two waiting in the reception room for questioning. And, Cyril trailed off and looked around, whispering to Felix. Kama the daughter of Count Kerbeck came into the student council room. She wants to talk to the daughter of Count Norn, the daughter of Count Kerbeck? Oh, little Squirrel's little sister. She's her niece without blood relation, muttering at him, the edge of Felix's lips raised. Good. Then have the daughter of Count Kerbeck be present as well, smiling chillingly at his beautifully formed face, Felix declared. Now, let's have a nice tea party. V5C8, the high-pitched laughter of a true villain Azareth GT Silent Witch June 3rd, 2021 9 minutes Caroline Simons the daughter of Count Norn, was sitting in a chair in the salon, irritably playing with the tassel on her fan. The two friends sitting next to her were looking at her resentfully, which was also annoying. Weren't you all totally into it? She was just reminding Monica Norton, who had been carried away lately, of her place in the academy. Her appearance was too shabby and her behavior was so unbecoming to be considered a girl. For some reason. The girl who was not worthy of this academy was elected to the student council. To top it all off, she was taught how to dance by Felix and Cyril. Those two were the stars of the academy. When she saw them at a party early this summer, Caroline attempted to get close to them somehow, but her attempt was a failure. As people always gathered around Felix and Cyril, Caroline could only watch from afar, unable to talk to them let alone ask them to dance. And yet, how could that girl dance with them? The fan in her grip creaked and squeaked. Everything was Monica Norton's fault. All she did was serve a slightly bitter tea. And yet, she made such a big deal out of it and brought shame to Caroline. What a hateful girl. Everything was her fault. Everything. A small crack appears on her fan. It was her favorite fan, but now it's broken. She has to beg her father for a new one. It will be fine. She believed that her father will help her. He doted on Caroline and donated a lot of money to the school. There was no way she would be expelled. Please excuse us, there was a knock at the door and two students entered the room. A softly swaying honey blonde with mysterious blue eyes tinted with green color, the always calm atmosphere of the second prince, Felix Arcridil. 
and platinum blonde hair mixed with a little honey and dark blue eyes resemble winter snow, the renowned ice prince, and also the eldest son of Marcus Hyen. Cyril Ashley they were the student council president and vice president of this academy, representing the pinnacle among the students. Felix took a seat across from Caroline and crossed his legs. Cyril stood behind him, glaring at Caroline and the others with cold eyes. Cyril wore a rigid face, but Felix was smiling as softly as ever. I knew it. His Highness would understand my action. I'm not at fault. As Caroline patted her chest in relief, Felix spoke up in a gentle voice. Caroline Simons, the daughter, of Count Norn. Shall we hear your side of the story in the attempt of poisoning Miss Monica Norton? Poisoning. At that word, Caroline and her friends' faces quickly changed. Even if you were a noble, murder is a serious crime. Even if it's merely an attempt, you will be punished with that equivalent crime. It was a misunderstanding, your highness. It was just a prank. And yet, Monica Norton has taken it upon herself to make a big deal out of it. That girl, must have been trying to embarrass me, by a prank, you mean putting poison into your classmate's cop, Felix's calm voice remained unchanged. And yet, the words that thrust to her were utterly cold and merciless. Caroline pleaded with teary eyes. That thing's not poisonous. It's just an eye drop. I've heard that it's very bitter and can be used as medicine to calm down. That's why I thought it would be good to bring her frightful manner to her senses. The latter part was just random nonsense. The eye drops bought from the merchant were said to be very bitter and should not be consumed. At the time, she just laughed at the idea of consuming eye drops. But now, she will bring any excuse as long as she could get away with it. As she was rattling off her excuses, Cyril pulled a small bottle wrapped in a handkerchief out of his pocket. It was Caroline's eye drop that was confiscated when she was taken into this salon. My younger sister, Claudia, told me that the eye drop you were carrying were regulated by law. You need to be a doctor or a certified pharmacist to be eligible to possess this item. Cyril's dark blue pupils glinted as he glared coldly at Caroline. Possessing such a dangerous drug illegally and then giving it to someone else, is if not attempted murder, then what? Cyril's younger sister, Claudia Ashley, was a true descendant of the intelligent family, also known as a walking library. She has a vast amount of knowledge that surpasses that of adults. If she declares so, then her words must be true. Caroline grew pale, but still desperately tried to find a way out. I didn't know that this eye drop was such a dreadful thing. I was told that it was just an eye drop. Oh, your highness, please believe me, as she pleaded with tears streaming down her face, Felix smiled softly. Right, without prior knowledge, you dripped that eye drop into Miss Monica Norton's cup, out of mischief, T that's right. And you did that to humiliate Miss Norton. In response to the words dropped calmly, Caroline bit her lip tightly and fell silent. Felix put his hand over his mouth and chuckled. I guess we can add libel to the list, comma she was sure her excuses were pretty good. But why has Felix not said anything to help Caroline? Why won't Felix defend her? At this moment, Caroline still really thought that she could get away with it if she passed it off as ignorance. Then, a knock came on the door. After Felix gave permission, a female student stepped into the salon and bowed gracefully. It was an orange-haired freshman styled into ringlets. She's a beautiful girl with a slightly stern face and a dignified air about her. My name is Isabel Norton, the daughter of Count Kerbeck. I am very grateful to you for allowing me to be present here. Monica Norton was said to be under the care of Count Kerbeck's household. Then it would be natural for Isabel, the daughter of Count Kerbeck, to be present here to hear the situation. It will be fine. The daughter of Count Kerbeck Lowe's and Harris is Monica Norton. If something happened to Monica Norton, the disgrace of Count Kerbeck's household, she probably wouldn't condemn me strongly. As Isabel sat down in the chair that Cyril had suggested, 
She cast her eyes down with a very apologetic look on her face. I have heard that our troublesome family member has caused trouble for you. Please accept my deepest apology on behalf of Count Kerbeck's household. Neither Felix nor Cyril said a word. But Caroline was secretly cheering in her heart. See, I knew it. The daughter of Count Kerbeck has no qualms about cutting off Monica Norton. If Isabel hated Monica, she would surely be on her side. Caroline secretly laughed. Isabel then glanced at Caroline and said, I know it's not much for an apology, but I've actually had my mates prepare some tea. I'm sure everybody is thirsty from all the talking. I do hope you will enjoy it, Isabel called out across the door, and her maid quietly entered the room, placing a tray on the table. As Caroline wondered why they weren't handing them out earlier, Isabel smiled and pulled a small bottle out of her pocket. Seeing the small bottle, Caroline and her cronies shrieked inwardly then cowered. The bottle was so similar to the bottle of eye drop that Caroline possessed. Right, since you are here, I hope you could try this medicine, Lady Caroline. I recently bought it from a merchant. I heard this beauty medicine has a very great effect. With that, Isabel dripped the liquid from the small bottle into the three cups. Isabel's chambermaid and handed out cups to everyone. Isabel, Felix, and Cyril were given cups without any medicine in them. While Caroline and her friend, the young ladies, were given cups dripped with medicine. As Caroline stared at the cup with a strained face, Isabel covered her mouth with a fan and chuckled. Despite the fact that her mouth was hidden, her smile was malevolent, clearly showing that she was mocking her. Comma please help yourself, Caroline stared at the cup. As that eye drop was odorless, she could not smell anything other than tea. Is that small bottle the same as my eye drops? Why would the daughter of Count Kerbeck have that in her possession? The fact that the daughter of Count Kerbeck just happened to possess the same eye drops as Caroline seems quite unnatural. But she believed it must be just a coincidence. Her companions, sitting next to her, looked at Caroline inquiringly. Neither of them even tried to touch the cup. Stop it. If you act like that, it's like admitting that the eye drop I possess was poison. There's no way it was the same eye drop. It must be a bluff. Caroline stared at the cup of tea, preparing herself, and took a sip. Comma PFFT. Ay, the strong bitter taste made Caroline spit out her tea. Salivating as she tried to avoid leaving a single drop in her mouth, she spat out the tea and glared at Isabel with eyes full of murderous intent. It was poison. This woman tried to poison me, my. Isabel was chuckling as she opened the lid of the small bottle and dripped it into her cup. She then drank the contents of the cup. I told you earlier, didn't I? It is good medicine for beauty. Well, perhaps you were surprised to find it a little bitter, why you, Fufu, is there a need for you to spew it out in such a disgraceful manner? I mean, that girl drank all the bitter tea you served her, didn't she, that girl? It goes without saying that she was referring to Monica Norton. Isabel huffed out a languid sigh and muttered. Indeed, that woman grew up in a bad environment and is the embarrassment of my household, but I appreciate the way she behaved as a guest, trying to drink all the tea, no matter how bad it was, but would that make you are less than that? And of all people, it's happening in the presence of His Highness, how vulgar. Isabel then inclined her fan to show her mouth and snickered. Caroline, who had tried to humiliate Monica in front of the crowd, was now, of all people, being humiliated by spewing tea in front of Felix. What is this? What is this? What is this? Felix didn't say anything. He just watched the exchange between Isabel and Caroline with a somewhat amused look on his face. Isabel was sipping her tea calmly and said, Oh right, in a tone as if she was having a little chat. Regarding this matter, I will notify my father as soon as possible. I mean, a person with the surname of Norton was almost poisoned to death. It's only natural, isn't it, 
It was only now that Caroline realized the magnitude of what she had done. Even though Isabel dislikes Monica, it didn't change the fact that Monica was the one bearing Norton's name. Caroline had picked a fight with Count Kerbeck's household. I believe our Count Kerbeck's household has a close relationship with your hometown, Count Norton's household. It's shame it had become like this. Count Kerbeck's domain was the widest domain in the eastern part of the Kingdom of Riddell. Its scale was not something that could be mocked as rural nobles. Above all, the mountainous areas in the east were home to many dragons, so those who had territories in the east were always suffering from dragon attacks. Although the dragon knights would come to the rescue if a request for help was sent to the royal capital, it would take a long time to reach the eastern part of the kingdom from the royal capital, so all the nobles who had territories in the eastern part usually had their own soldiers. And the biggest of them all was the Count of Kerbeck. For this reason, when a dragon attacked a noble household in the east and the dragon knights couldn't get there in time, they often turned to the neighboring the Count of Kerbeck, and Caroline's own family, Count Norn's household, were no exception. Count Norn's household has been saved by the soldiers of Count Kerbeck's household many times whenever his territory was threatened by the dragon. However, what would happen if your daughter returned the favor with malicious intent? What if Count Kelbeck is not aiding the Norn Countdom anymore? The weak military power of Count Norn would not be able to endure the dragon attacks, and at worst they could be destroyed. W8. Why you've got the wrong idea? I didn't mean it, to be like that, as Caroline making excuses in a desperate manner, Isabel gave her a cold look. Isabel was younger than Caroline by a year. However, her intimidation was so overwhelming that even Caroline can't hold a candle. Isabel only narrowed her eyes slightly, shattering Caroline's pride as she sneered at her. Because of your thoughtlessness, it brings ruin to your homeland. Such things do often happen in high society, isn't it? Isabel brushed back her orange ringlets as she smiled haughtily, lifting her chin. Now, when you get back to your dormitory, make sure you tell your dear friends, what will happen if they make an enemy of my Count Kerbeck's household, as if she were speaking in a play. Isabel was laughed oh ho 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 ho, in a high-pitched cheerful tone. V5C9 Regarding the Silent Witch Azeroth GT Silent Witch June 6, 2021 7 minutes after Isabel Norton has done her solo performance, Caroline Simmons and her two friends were taken by the teacher to another room. Cyril snorted as he watched them go. It has not been officially decided yet, but Caroline, the perpetrator of the incident, will be forced to leave school, while her two friends were expected to leave voluntarily. Until the very end, Miss Caroline refused to admit that she was at fault. On the contrary, she put the blame on Monica and tried to excuse herself. How foolish. Like the previous treasurer who was expelled a while ago, they don't understand that this place serves as an extension of their social circle. They think that if something happens, their parents will lay out their money to fix it. If money could buy trust, there would be no hardship. How thoughtless of them to think of that. Once Caroline had left the room and things had quieted down, Isabel Norton straightened herself up and bowed to Felix and Cyril. Your Highness, I apologize for the disgraceful appearance in your presence. It was hard to believe that she had been doing the high-pitched laughter just now. Cyril thought, women are terrifying. Felix, however, responded with a gentle smile. It was quite amusing. By the way, do you think your father will abandon Count Norn? In response to Felix's question, Isabel shook her head without hesitation. No, my father is very sensible. He would never abandon another territory out of emotion. Count Norn's territory was one of the most important supply routes. Having the road closed after the damage caused by the dragon would prove to be quite inconvenient. Well. This was the powerful Count Kerbeck after all. He will probably use this matter as a bargaining card with the Norn Count family. Count Kelbeck was the most influential noble in the eastern part of the Kingdom of Riddle. 
The eastern part of the Kingdom of Riddle has experienced many disasters caused by dragons, and since it was adjacent to several countries, including the Empire, it will be the front line in case of emergency, therefore, the nobles in the eastern part of the Kingdom have military power that rivals that of the royal capital. This is why the eastern provinces were the most threatening if they started a rebellion. Fearful of the eastern nobles rebelling and turning their troops against the center, the central nobles have been trying to control the size of the eastern nobles' army. That's what Cyril's adoptive father, Marcus Hyen, once said. However, the nobility in the east can't reduce their forces so easily. The eastern part of the country has always been beset with two treats, the neighboring country and the dragons. That's why my adoptive father said he doesn't want Count Kerbeck to become his enemy. In the struggle to determine the next king, Count Kerbeck held a neutral position. Forcing them to take sides would be difficult. Therefore, keeping them from becoming enemies would be the safest thing to do. As Cyril was pondering these things, Felix was speaking to Isabel in a casual tone. Oh, speaking of Count Kerbeck's territory. That Black Dragon Wogan's incident must have been tough, on that occasion, we would like to thank His Majesty for dispatching the Dragon Knights from the capital. I am grateful for his prompt and generous action, to Isabel's auspicious attitude, Felix then said in a joking tone. Maybe the Count's army alone could have managed without the arrival of the Dragon Knights, the Count's soldiers were accustomed to killing dragons so they often managed to kill them before the Dragon Knights arrived. That's why Felix said in a roundabout way that it might have been unnecessary to dispatch the Dragon Knights, but Isabel was like, of course not, exclaimed. Our Count Kerbeck family has a history of fighting dragons for hundreds of years. Even with such a history, we have only faced a black dragon once before, 200 years ago. The reason we were able to defeat the Black Dragon Wogan was thanks to the efforts of the Dragon Knight San, the Silent Witch who lent her power, the Silent Witch, was a young genius who became one of the Seven Sages two years ago at the tender age of 15. Cyril had never seen her before, but it was rumored that the Silent Witch always wore a robe over her head and kept her head down, even during ceremonies, and never showed her face. A robe over her head? Something stimulated Cyril's memory. A hooded robe was nothing unusual. But a strange feeling rose in his heart, as he remembered the events of that night. While Cyril was quietly suppressing his agitation, Isabel said in a slightly more excited tone. Although I didn't see it with my own eyes. I heard that, silent witch, shot down more than twenty wyverns that had been following the black dragon in an instant. Well, I'm not much of a magician, but that sounds amazing, Felix gestured at her in a way that seemed to be impressed. Shoot down over twenty moving targets in an instant? Such a thing is impossible. Dragons have a weakness for cold, but their bodies were sturdy and highly resistant to magic, making them impervious to most spells. To defeat it, they would have to aim at the eyeballs or the space between the eyes but accurately aiming at the space between the eyebrows or the eyeballs against a moving target would be extremely difficult, even for an advanced magician. In addition, shooting down more than 20 of them at the same time, such a thing was. Suddenly, the events of the night a few weeks ago came back to Cyril's mind. Terribly advanced magic that accurately shot down the ice blocks released by Cyril, who had gone out of control. It wasn't the kind of situation where the chanting could be done in time. And yet, that person was able to deploy such precise magic with Cyril's afterthought, a silent monster. That person might be able to use magic to target the eyebrows of more than 20 wyverns, just as he shot off Cyril's eyes. As he listened to Isabel's impassioned talk about the silent witch, Cyril had quietly pushed down his agitation. After chatting with Felix, Isabel left the salon and walked down the hallway with her chambermaid, Agatha in tow. She could see the eyes of the students glancing at her. Most of them look at her in awe. 
It was probably because Caroline had spread the word about what Isabel had done to her early on. My lady, are you sure about this? Yes, I was prepared for that. Trampling on someone is an act of making enemies, of course. Still, Isabel dared to retaliate against Caroline. Stay out of the way of the Count Kerbeck family. Once that unspoken agreement was established, no one would dare mess with Monica. Monica Everett, the silent witch, was a benefactor to all who lived in the territory of Count Kerbeck. When the presence of the Black Dragon was discovered in her territory, all the people living in the Count's territory mourned in despair. For humans, dragons represent a disaster. And the most feared of them all is the Black Dragon. The Black Dragon's scales are said to repel all sorts of magic, and the flames it spits out are the flames of the underworld, burning away even defensive barriers. Legend has it that a single Black Dragon could destroy an entire country. Even a fire breathed out by a Black Dragon on a whim could kill dozens or hundreds of people. The flames of the Black Dragon burned through iron and stone, leaving not even the bones of a human being. Still. Both Isabel and Agatha had resolved to stay in the mansion until the end. Death was something they were prepared for. But the report that came from the battlefield was, comma with the help of the silent witch's spells, we shot down 24 wyverns. The black dragon was defeated. The silent witch used the spell to wipe out the wyverns that had been gathered in one place by the dragon knights and then she proceeded to the nest of the black dragon to fight it. Although she was unable to finish the black dragon off, she succeeded in driving it away from Count Kerbeck's territory. Isabel has understood how much effort and sacrifice it takes to defeat a single wyvern. What the silent witch has done was nothing but a miracle. For the Count Kerbeck family, the Silent Witch, was their great savior. And yet, she left Count Kerbeck's domain without accepting any hospitality. So, when Lewis Miller asked her to support the Silent Witch, she agreed to do everything in her power to support Monica. After returning to her own room and closing the door, Isabel looked around her room and put her finger on her chin. Say, Agatha. We can put another bed in this room, can't we? Of course you can, my lady. The clever Agatha immediately understood what Isabel wanted. Isabel humped and clenched her fists. In that case, please arrange for a new bed immediately. Big Sister Monica will probably have to take some time off from her classes to recuperate. Unfortunately, I cannot take good care of her in the attic. I will have to ask her to come to this room under the watchful eyes of the other students, certainly. I'll make arrangements as soon as possible. Thank you. Fufu. -fu. Sharing a room with my beloved big sister. Oh, she must have been hurt both physically and mentally by this incident. I must comfort her. Does she like romance novels? I'd be happy to lend her one of my recommended series. Ah, it would be wonderful if we could have a novel talk together. Oh, right. Sleepwear. Agatha. Don't forget to prepare her sleepwear. A very cute one that matches mine. Isabel's eyes sparkled as she pleaded, and Agatha, the capable chambermaid, answered emphatically, Please leave it to me. V5C10, the phenomenon of secret fans instantly becoming fast talkers when they find a place to discuss. As Earth GT Silent Witch June 7, 2021 seven minutes after discussing with the teacher about Caroline's punishment, Felix went to the infirmary, but there was no sign of Monica in there. Apparently, she had returned to her room in the dormitory. Although he was concerned about whether she could get back to the dormitory properly, Claudia was with her, so she wouldn't force Monica to do anything. Incidentally, that little squirrel seems to be living in the attic. Apparently, the daughter of Count Kerbeck made her do so. Actually, I wanted to warn Miss Isabel not to harass the little squirrel too much. Asking Isabel why she was harassing Monica would mean getting into the inner workings of the Count Kerbeck family. Count Kerbeck was a large noble family who stood neutral. It would be unwise for Felix, the second prince, to meddle in their affairs. 
Well, if Miss Isabel was the one who was tormenting Monica and making her cry, then he could be the one to spoil her. It's easier to tame that little squirrel when there's an obvious bully. At first, I was hoping Cyril would fill that role, but he's been so soft on Miss Norton lately. Regardless of his change of heart, Cyril was the first one to pick up Monica when she had to be carried to the infirmary, though he ran out of steam in the process. Surprisingly, Cyril might be thinking of Monica as a younger sister. After all, her own sister, Claudia, was like that. Recalling how the two siblings interacted with each other, Felix was chuckling as he shut the door of his room with a click. Then a white lizard crawled easily out of Felix's breast pocket. The lizard slithered from Felix's body down to the ground and immediately transformed into a human form. Having taken the form of a chamberlain with light blue hair and blue eyes, Will bowed to Felix. Today was, well, quite a day, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's been a while since I've heard her name, her, Will gave him a quizzical look, and Felix's lips raised slowly to form into a smile. Lady Everett, the, silent witch, Isabel Norton had spoken that topic with eyes glittering in the salon. Although I didn't see it with my own eyes. I heard that, silent witch, shot down more than twenty wyverns that had been following the black dragon in an instant. Anyone with any knowledge of magic would frown upon that as an exaggeration. But Felix knew. That Isabel's words were not a lie. Because Felix had witnessed it a few months ago. Just at that time, Felix was on a secret trip to the eastern region. However, the eastern region was in chaos due to the appearance of the black dragon. The roads were flooded with people who abandoned their villages and towns to evacuate and Felix was forced to stay there. Since it was inconvenient for him if his identity was revealed to the people around him, he was moving away from the flow of people and unfortunately bumped into a group of wyverns moving towards him. There, he saw it. A swarm of wyverns covered the sky. The deafening, gargling cry was very aggressive and it was clear that it was on edge. Whenever one of the wyverns freakishly glided past a nearby house, its claws would rip off the roof and the wind pressure would break the trees. It was a disaster with a will of its own. Each of the large wyverns was larger than a house. The sight of more than twenty of them flying in the sky was like a nightmare. But at the very next moment, ice spears rained down from the sky. There were twenty-four of them, exactly the same number as the wyverns. The ice blades which looked like they would have taken a grown man to make a circle with his arms, all accurately pierced at the wyvern's brow. The wyverns that had lost their strength were falling toward the ground in a trickle, into a village. All the inhabitants have been evacuated, leaving their houses is. Just as the wyvern's bodies were about to collide with the house, it slid away as if swept away by the wind before falling softly to the empty ground. It wasn't just one. All twenty-four of them fell gently and silently like wings fluttering in the wind, piling up on the white ground. Felix, who had been watching from a distance, forgot to breathe and was mesmerized by the scene. Comma what a cruelly silent, yet beautiful spell. Since Felix was some distance away from the scene, he was unable to see the magician, but he later learned from others that the magician was one of the seven sages, the silent witch. He had seen the silent witch a few times at the ceremony. However, she always wore a hooded robe, so Felix had never seen her face. Despite being the youngest genius in the world, the silent witch rarely appeared in public, and among the seven sages, she was the most reserved and inconspicuous, nor have as impressive a record as her peer Lewis Miller. And yet she was such an amazing magician. Felix hummed as he took the key out of his pocket and unlocked the drawer to reveal a bundle of essays. Seeing this, Will blinked moderately. Are those papers that the silent witch wrote while at Minerva? Yeah, I asked Madame Cassandra to get it for me. These papers contain the positional coordinates and variations of very advanced magic essays. Felix trailed off there and lowered his eyebrows in slight disappointment. Right. 
You spirits have never been tangled in spells, have you? Yes, we spirits use magic with our senses, so we don't understand how to weave a formula. Spirits can use their mana as naturally as a human can pick up an object from a desk. However, it precisely because humans were not as good at using magic as spirits that they weave magic formulas and activate them as spells. The principles of the Silent Witch, Lady Everett's no chanting spell have not been revealed, but there is no doubt that she has a very good mind. This essay was written by the Silent Witch when she was a student. And it can be said that the publication of this essay has changed the common sense of extensive magic. The accuracy of the magic has improved dramatically. When we spirit aim at something with our attack magic, we somehow aim at it and somehow release our mana. Humans can't use mana with just somehow. We have to understand how it works. We have a logical formula and use mana in the form of spell. For example, I imagine attacking an enemy with a fire spell. First, in order to create the fire, the magician must determine the temperature, size, shape, and duration of the fire, all of these things. Furthermore, in order to fire it to the enemy, the speed, angle, and distance must be calculated and fine-tuned to take into account the climate and wind direction. Unless they were accurately incorporated into the magic formula, the spells would not work properly. In the worst case scenario, a fireball would explode at hand, causing a tragedy. Spells require a great deal of calculation. Human chanting is similar to the need for a formula in the middle of an arduous mathematical equation. Once you get used to it, you can make some omissions, but you can't just look at a complicated mathematical formula and suddenly arrive at the answer, can you? But there's one person exception, a genius magician, without the need for chanting, can answer difficult magic formulas in an instant. And she was the, silent witch. Recalling her robes from the ceremony, Felix unconsciously raised the corner of his mouth. If I could, I'd like to see it again, her serene, beautiful magic, closing his eyelids brought back the scene of wyverns quietly falling through the sky. The wyverns had died instantly, almost without shedding any blood. How merciless, how cruel, how beautiful. Felix clutched the silent witch's papers onto his chest and let out a sweet exhalation. Ah, I wonder how the spell that shot down the wyverns at that time calculated the enemy's coordinate axis. Even incorporating a tracking spell. It would not be possible to accurately target the area between the eyebrows with the current performance of the tracking spells. I wouldn't be surprised if the silent witch had developed a new tracking spell, but I don't think it was a tracking spell because the eye seemed to be flying straight at that time. If so, it would mean that she accurately calculated the positions of the 24 wyverns and instantly activated her spells to pierce the space between their eyebrows, but grasping the positions of all 24 wyverns and firing her magic at the same time is unheard of. I suspect that the silent witch may have a frighteningly high level of spatial perception. Excuse me, your highness, your tea's ready. Oh, yeah, thanks. You can leave it there, and Will, who was very sincere, said with a look of sincere apology on his face. After gave a small nod at the cursory instructions and he placed his cup of tea on the table. I deeply apologize for my inability to understand what your highness is saying due to my lack of understanding. No, I apologize for getting carried away. There was no one else I could talk to about this. Felix flipped through the papers and looked over what was written in them. It was a very advanced and complex essay. However, after reading the contents of the paper so many times to the point where it became a habit to fold the paper, he was able to easily remember the contents of the paper with just a quick glance. He had read it so much that he had memorized it. Many, many times. I have a feeling that Miss Isabel Norton and I would get along well as fans of the Silent Witch. When Felix assured him that he was a fan, Will advised him with a complicated look. Your Highness, 
We shouldn't be talking about the magic outside, I know. I'll behave myself. I'll have to pretend that I'm not familiar with magic. That's why he hasn't taken any classes on practical spell casting at the school, and he has hidden the fact that he has made a contract with Will, a high-ranking spirit. Suddenly, Felix had a thought. The magic formula resembled a mathematical equation, if so, what would happen if Monica Norton, who has an outstanding ability to calculate, were to learn magic? I wonder if that little squirrel has any interest in magic. I'm sure she's got some qualities, I don't know. But, without a certain amount of mana, she won't able to use spells, I guess so. Felix pondered as he looked down at the paper in his hand. What will that little squirrel think when she reads this paper? Well, I guess she would be more interested in these papers than in me. Extra Story 1, Romance and Tale Azareth GT Silent Witch June 8, 2021 5 minutes sitting on the fluffiest bed she's ever had and wearing a silk nightgown she's never slept in before, Monica flipped through the pages of her novel feeling uncomfortable with the intense stare she was receiving. After reaching the last page of the book, Monica let out a breath and rubbed her tired eyes. At that moment, Isabel, who had been sitting by the bedside the whole time, spoke up with a gleam in her eye. What did you think? Maron Philo's masterpiece, The White Rose Maiden Sleeps in the Garden, W. Well, Monica was at a loss for words to reply letting her gaze wander around. T the phrasing is, rather unique, isn't it? Indeed, Maron Philo uses poetic language very beautifully, and above all, her descriptions of the scenes in the heroine's psychology are wonderful. The story is superb, too. The parting scene in the third chapter is unforgettable, and you can't read it without shedding tears. Monica, who had read that very third chapter without tears, felt very sorry for her. Monica, who has not been used to reading stories since her childhood, has difficulty understanding this kind of unique expression in fictional stories. For example, white skin as smooth as white porcelain, black hair like melted ebony dusted with jewels, and lips as fresh as wild strawberries, all of which would be fine with just white skin, black hair, and red lips, but still. She could not bring herself to deny what was recommended to her, so she smiled vaguely while giving some feedback. Then Isabel's chambermaid, Agatha, spoke softly to her. My lady, it is almost time for dinner. Oh my, it's already time for dinner. Well then, big sister Monica, I will be leaving for the dining hall in a little while. I'll have Agatha prepare a meal for you, tea thank you, as she thanked her. Monica let out a sigh of relief. After getting drugged by Miss Caroline and sent to the infirmary, Monica took a few days off from class to recuperate in Isabel's room. Monica didn't mind being in the attic, but Isabel had already brought a bed into her room for her, so she could not refuse. To be honest, Monica, who was not used to living with other people, couldn't help but feel restless, but her chambermaid, Agatha, dealt with the situation skillfully. Whenever Isabel got too excited, Agatha would subtly correct her. Even now, Agatha ushered Isabel into the dining room and brought Monica a tray with food on it. I'll leave your meal over here. Please ring this bell when you are done, T. Thank you, Agatha smiled, bowed, and left the room. She appreciated the concern, knowing that Monica was not used to eating in a public place. Monica climbed out of bed and sat down in a chair. On the table were soft bread, cheese, sautéed fish, potage, and sweetened apples. Agatha had gone to the trouble of preparing all of them for Monica in the dining room. Grateful for Isabel's and Agatha's thoughtfulness, Monica sliced a piece of bread and brought it to her mouth. The fluffy white bread was soft with a slight sweetness. Such soft bread was not something she could eat very often in the mountains. The one Monica was eating at the cabin was black bread hard as a stone. It was delicious when eaten with cheese, though. As she chewed on the bread and reminisced about her life in the cabin, she heard the sound of scratchings on the window. Looking over, it was actually Nero scratching at the window. 
Monica stood up and opened the window, allowing Nero to easily enter the room before he twitched his nose. It smells good, I have some fish. You want some, I don't like fish, you know. I prefer meat. I like birds, especially birds. As soon as Nero jumped up on the desk and saw that there was no meat, he frowned in frustration and said, These cheese will do for now. Once she placed a small plate of cheese in front of Nero, he took a bite of the cheese, seeming to really like the taste. It's so good. Now if we could only get some meat, it would be perfect. Hey, I think I'll go hunting again tonight. After all the fuss over the bird bone stuck in your throat, that was just a youthful indiscretion. Wise creatures grow day by day by repeating mistakes like that. Nero nodded plausibly and wagged his tail when he noticed that there was a novel on Monica's bedside table. It's unusual for you to read a novel. Oh, I get it. The Orange Rose recommended it to you, didn't she? You're being rude to Lady Isabel. The Orange Rose must be referring to Isabel's hair. Nero basically never tried to remember people's names. Despite Monica's protests, Nero was still gazing at the cover of the novel as he bit into a piece of cheese. That's a writer I don't know. Hey, was that novel interesting? I wasn't sure. How's the story? Looking at Nero's curious eyes, Monica tore off a piece of bread as she ruminated on the story she had just finished reading. Comma there was a man and a woman, okay, a lot of things happened, oh ho, they're getting married, then, the end, Nero's tail stopped moving and he stared up at Monica. I understand now that you weren't a one bit impressed by the novel. But, that a lot of things happened part is what's important. You've omitted hundreds of thousands of words, because I really didn't know any of this. That novel told the story of the unfortunate heroine who meets a young nobleman by a rose tree and falls in love with him at first sight. However, the young man had a fiancé. When his fiancé refuses to acknowledge the breakup of the engagement, she schemes to get rid of the heroine, but the two overcome their ordeal and end up together. However, Monica can't understand why the heroine and the young nobleman fell in love, in the first place. The young man had a fiancé, so the fiancé had every right to be furious. Kama how could she become so infatuated over someone like this? The characters in the story were infatuated with the other person as if they were drowning. They were madly in love with each other. They want to love and be loved. They want to choose or want to be chosen, no matter how much it costs them. This seemed somewhat frightening to Monica. Kama how can someone expect so much, from another person, Nero's tail wagged in response to the muttering, and he looked up at Monica with golden eyes. I guess you're too young to understand. Love is like, when you fall, your heart skips a beat. Like, a zap, Monica stared at Nero, who said with a knowing look on his face. Kama so, do you know what love is, Nero, of course I am. I like females with sexy tails, by the way, tail, I can't lust after a female without a tail, so you're out of my scope. So don't worry, it was a world that Monica, who had no tail, could not understand. Maybe, just like Monica herself didn't have a tail, she didn't have any interest in love in the first place. Satisfied with that conclusion, Monica tore off a piece of bread and stuffed it into her mouth. It's a matter of not knowing what love is. The timid Monica can't hope for anyone or anything. She can't expect anything. What she wanted madly was just a number that would never betray her. Extra Story 2 Scholar Family Mediator Family Azareth GT Silent Witch June 12, 2021 10 minutes The Ashley family has been known as the Scholar Family for generations but they originally were a family of librarians. Perhaps as a remnant of their legacy, the Ashley family owned a library and three study rooms. The number of books in the library was no less than the library in the royal capital. Claudia who growing up surrounded by such an enormous amount of books, naturally would read them in her spare time. The adults around her called her a book-loving girl, but Claudia wasn't particularly fond of reading. 
she has a slightly different hobby. For Claudia, the act of reading a book was a natural act. Just as eating when hungry, she reads books when she doesn't know something. That was all there was to it. And for that reason, Claudia thought the act of reading no more than that. The same can be said for the rest of Ashley's family members. And Claudia's father was no exception. Therefore, her scholar father, Marcus Hyen, was visited every day by those who sought his advice. Some were representing their own people, some were local nobles, and some were from other countries. Come I'm in trouble because my fields are not yielding. Please tell me how to grow more crops even in a drought. Comma it's about inheritance property control. Please tell me how to get an upper hand over my brother. Comma a sailor became ill during a voyage. Please tell me how to treat it. Everyone was clinging on to her father, saying, Please tell me, please tell me. As she watched such scenes, the child Claudia thought to herself, Why do these people never try to figure things out for themselves? Most of the questions they brought up were things that could be found in a book. No one ever bothered to figure it out themselves. They only want to know the answer. Claudia was experiencing the same things as well. In her primary school, people would come to Claudia to ask her about things they didn't understand. Treating her like nothing more than a walking library, everyone also thought of all the Ashley family members was like that. It would be worse when they felt grateful to her. After they felt grateful for Claudia because she could be relied upon, they would back to ask on her again, and again. That's why Claudia despised their gratitude. So, when people tried to talk to her, Claudia would show her gloomy face as if she didn't feel like talking to them. Its gloomy was like that of a person who seemed to have one of her family members died. Its effect was so great making no one came near Claudia after, leaving her with plenty time to read a book quietly. Claudia was truly happy about that. One day, a letter arrived at her father's door. A certain baron wanted to visit her father to ask for his advice on something. After her father read the letter, his face was expressionless but somewhat jubilant, she sure for it. He even arranged for the servants to prepare a reception for that person. Kama who's our guest today, after begin asked by Claudia, her father lifted his glasses and spoke up. Baron Maywood would like to discuss something with me, he's come to ask some advice, isn't he? But you seem quite enthused about it, even arranged the servants to receive that person, in response to his daughter's bitter remark, her father muttered, I see as he expected her reply. To an outsider, he may look cold and impassive, but to his family, his excitement was apparent. The corners of his mouth were slightly raised under his well-trimmed beard. Baron Maywood always comes to me for advice when he's done looking everything within his means before seeking a different point of view. He's not come to seek for my wisdom, but my opinion. The wine I drink always tastes better when I've him accompany me, said her father, concluding the story. Claudia knew that her father did not like to drink very much. To be able to make such a father enjoying his drink, Baron Maywood must be an outstanding man like no other, she thought at the time. Well, it's nice to see you, Marcus Hyen. It's been a long time. Oh, is that Miss Claudia over there? She looks very lovely. Claudia's first impression of Baron Maywood was one word, plain. He appeared to be younger than her father, and his clothes were plain with few ornaments. He probably a Baron who wasn't from a wealthy family. The smile on his face was somewhat unreliable with his relaxed eyebrows, making him look amicably and not very smart. I brought my son with me today. Neil, introduce yourself, as Baron Maywood urged. A small boy stepped out from behind, looked straight up at Marcus Hyen with a shy smile, then greeted him. My name is Neil Clay Maywood, eldest son of Baron Maywood. It is an honor to meet you, he was a boy with straight eyes. Though he only appeared to be about ten years old, he was said to be thirteen, the same age as Claudia. Apparently, looking young was their family trait. Ushered into the parlor by Claudia's father which was Marcus Hyen, 
together with Baron Maywood, had a brief discussion. The topic was mainly about the mediation between the Magician's Association and the Noble Council. Apparently, the Magician's Association has requested the Council to lift the ban on medical spells, and Baron Maywood's task to arbitrate the meeting. For generations, the Baron Maywood family has been involved mainly in mediating these kinds of negotiations. If the Marcus Hyen family was known as the Scholar family, then Baron Maywood's family was known as the Mediator family. Despite his position as a noble, a mediator's job is to guide the two sides of the debate to reach a satisfactory settlement in an impartial manner, without taking sides with the noble council. Lifting the ban on medical spells would certainly save some lives. That's a fact. However, in my opinion, it is still too early. We need both medical and spells research development to reach the same level of maturity. But, medical development in this country is not mature yet, I agree. In some areas, there are still doctors who use superstition as a form of medicine. Lifting the ban on medical spells in this situation will only add to the actions of such frauds, first of all, the bad effect of mana in the human body. I think we need to do more verification of that. The data we've collected on the part of the Magician's Association is still insufficient. If things continue like this, the medical development may be eclipsed by the magic development, definitely. On top of that, we should train those who are proficient in both medicine and spells. I am certain medical spells will be developing in the future, but at the moment, the foundation for it has not even been laid. So, we should concentrate on cultivating the soil, you are right. However, hearing someone has a family member with a disease that is untreatable by today's medical treatment, tend to make me get emotional in mediating. The ban on medical spells should be lifted as soon as possible. Are you trying to kill my daughter when someone said that? It made me felt so depressed. I understand how painful it is to feel that way. If the wrong method of treatment caused mana poisoning and led her to death, there would be no saving the child. Yeah, that's why we should proceed more carefully, as she quietly listened to the conversation between her father and Baron Maywood. Baron Maywood turned his head and looked at Claudia. He then relaxed his eyebrows and smiled wryly. Sorry, that wasn't very interesting, was it? No, I found it very interesting. I can tell the arguments of the magicians, who are trying to push their case based on emotionalism without sufficient data, and the noble council, who are concerned that the interests of the medical association will flow into the magicians if doctors and magicians team up, Baron Maywood rounded his eyes slightly at Claudia's words. However, he didn't seem particularly offended, and rather calmly relaxing his eyebrows and smiled. You're very clever. Indeed. It precisely because of that I need to proceed more carefully, before making my decision, Neil who was sitting next to Baron Maywood, rounded his eyes and looked at Claudia. He must have been taken aback by Claudia's statement. I don't know how much that little boy with a young face understands my words, he even might not able to understand everything. As Claudia was thinking about this, her father glanced at her and said in a low voice, Claudia, go give young Neil a tour of our mansion. Her father probably thought Claudia was bored. 2. She suspected the topics they would talk about would be things that can't be heard by children. Um, please treat me well, this is like I've become a person who's showing the way for children, Claudia thought to herself. Comma any place do you want to see, um, I want to see your garden, okay, for him being interested in gardens rather than books in the Ashley family, which boasts such a large collection of books, was quite unusual. Claudia led Neil into the garden, secretly thinking that it would be easier for her if he would just stay quiet and read a book. Having walked next to each other for a while, she found him looked even younger. He was a little shorter than Claudia and his appearance didn't match his age. Noticing Claudia was giving him a side glance, Neil then responded with a smile which much like his father. You are amazing, Miss Claudia. 
You even grasp the true meaning behind such a difficult event. I haven't thought about the reason behind the Noble Council. I didn't expect the Medical Association and the Noble Council have a strong connection. My father let me present to be the meeting was to study, but I'm not ready yet, apparently. He barely able to grasp the meaning behind their father's were discussion. Neil folded his arms groaning with a difficult face. I wonder if there was any proof that clearly shows the connection between the Noble Council and the Medical Association. The current head of the Medical Association is, um, Neil was groaning as question after question came from him, never once asked about them to Claudia. Unexpectedly, Claudia opened her mouth. Comma you're not going to ask, huh, I am the daughter of Marcus Hyen. The scholar family. I have enough wisdom to answer most of your questions, in fact, Claudia has all the answers to the questions that Neil had mentioned. However, Neil showed a slight sign of thinking and then shook his head firmly. No, I will look it up when I get home. If you don't know something, you should look it up yourself. If you still can't figure it out. Ask someone who can, that's what my father told me, all right, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for refusing while you've intended to answer my questions, but, Claudia didn't say she would answer his questions. She just said that she knew the answer. However, this apparently good-natured boy seemed to have interpreted Claudia's statement as one of the good intentions. I'm going to do some investigation at home. So if I still don't understand, please do tell me, Claudia did not confirm or deny. It wasn't that she was being mean. It was because she couldn't decide which was the best response. If she told him there's no way I would give you my answer, or something in a cold tone, perhaps that boy will never visit her again. And she felt like she would regret it later. Opened the door without a word, Claudia was walking straight down the well-marked path. Comma we've arrived in our garden, wow, there's a lot of medical herbs, Marcus Hyen family has half of his garden planted with ornamental flowers and half with medicinal herbs. While the latter was grown by her father as a way to put into practice his knowledge on medicinal herbs. Her father was a man who believed that this kind of knowledge was only valuable if it was put into practice. Marcus Hyen has aired that man of a taciturn knowledgeable man. But he was surprisingly a man of action. Look at this, Miss Claudia. This herb, it's the kind that helps with cut wounds. How could I possibly not know? Well, you're right. Scratching his cheek in embarrassment, Neil crouched down on the spot and reached for a weed growing outside the flower bed. Then do you what is this? It's weeds. She could even tell him its scientific name if he wanted. Along with its habitats, too. In front of the thinking Claudia, Neil plucked a weed and snapped both its edges, put it in his mouth and blew on it. Whistle a high-pitched sounded. If you cut this grass here and squeeze this area, you can make whistles. Our shepherds often do this, I've never heard about it before. As Claudia spoke quietly, Neil giggled and blew his grass flute happily. The sound was high, clear, and pleasant. As soon as Baron Maywood and his son went out to return to their home, Claudia immediately made an announcement to her father. Father, I would like to marry Neil. Claudia said this with her usual gloomy air, but Marcus Hine neither surprised nor scolded her, simply stared at her in silence. After staring at each other in silence for a while, Marcus Hine slowly opened his mouth. Neil is the eldest son who will inherit the Maywood family so I can't make him come to her house as my son-in-law. Claudia thought her father would continue with his denial thereafter, but when he playing with his mustache, he blurted out. I guess I would have to adopt a son to take over the family. Claudia's mother died soon after giving birth to Claudia, and her father never took a second wife. So at this point, Claudia was the only person in the direct line of the Marcus Hyen family. Certainly. If he adopted the son who would succeed the Marcus Hyen family, Claudia would be able to marry Neil off without any problems. However, she knew her father wished to have come into his house as his son-in-law. So you do not disagree with it, I know you'll come to love him, 
The words that her father said as he tried to hold his tongue were filled with a strange sense of reality. Indeed, both father and daughter have a weakness for the Baron Maywood family. Marcus Hyam did not mention the fact that the blood of the direct lineage of the scholar family would be cut off. He also knew that knowledge was not passed down by their blood, but education. Now, I should make some arrangements for an adoption. I'd like him to be a person whose desire to improve oneself, even if he's from a distant family. After saying this, Marcus Hyan took out one document after another from his writing desk. Claudia, the daughter, wanted to marry him the next day after the meeting, and her father, who heard her daughter yearning for that marriage of a sudden, immediately started preparing documents for adoption and engagement. Like the father like the daughter, their quick decisions were so similar, 